Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the uh, 13th meeting, uh, 30th, sorry, meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2017. Could I ask everyone in the room to ensure the mobile phones are on silent? It's acceptable to use mobiles for social media, but please don't take photographs or record proceedings. Um, the first item on our agenda is a roundtable evidence session on care home sustainability. Um, uh, I'll introduce myself, and then we'll go anti-clockwise round the room, if people could briefly introduce themselves. Uh, before I mm -hmm. do that, um, can I apologise for the temperature in the room. There's been a problem with the heat sensors today, so it's a bit colder, but hopefully it will heat up uh, quickly. Um, so um, my name is Neil Finlay, I chair the Health and Sport Committee, and I'm a MSP for the Lothian region. Good morning. My name's Ash Denham. I'm um, a MSP for Edinburgh Eastern, and I'm the deputy convener of this committee. Hi, I'm Paula McClay. I'm the Chief Officer for Health and Social Care, COSLA. Good morning, I'm Miles Briggs. I'm Conservative MSP for Lothian and Conservative Spokesman for Health and Sport. Morning, my name's Fiona Mackay. I'm Head of Strategic Planning, and Performance and Commissioning in Fife Health and Social Care Partnership. Morning, I'm Alex Cole Hamilton, a Lib Dem MSP for Edinburgh Weston and my party's health spokesperson. Good morning, I'm Donald McCaskill, Chief Executive <coughs> of Scottish Care. Uh, good morning, I'm Jenny Gorruth, the MSP for Mid Fife and Glen Rothes. Good morning, my name is Gordon Patterson. I'm the Chief Inspector for Adult Services at the Care Inspectorate. Good morning, my name is Emma Harper. I'm MSP for South Scotland Region. Morning, I'm Brian Logan and I'm Chief Executive of Beald Housing and Care. Hello, Alison Johnston, MSP for Lothian. Hello, Annie Gunner Logan, Director of the Coalition of Care and Support Providers in Scotland. And for Transparency Chair, I should also say that I'm a non executive director in Scottish Government, but I'm not here in that capacity today. Hi, Ivan McKee, MSP for Glasgow Proven. Good morning, my name's Michelle Miller. I'm the Interim Chief Officer for the Edinburgh Health and Social Care Partnership. Uh, good morning, I'm Brian Whittle, I'm a Conservative South of Scotland MSP and Party Sportsman Health Education, Lifestyle and Sport. Uh, good morning, uh, Sandra White, MSP for Glasgow Kelvin. Uh, good morning, Sheena Simpson, Policy Lead, Scottish Federation of Housing Associations. Uh, good morning, I'm uh, Colin Smith, MSP for the South of Scotland. Uh, I'm also a Labour spokesperson on public health and social care. OK, thanks very much. Um, this morning we obviously want to keep this as free-flowing as possible, so if people just indicate to me, I'll try and um, bring you in uh, as much as possible. Um, there's two sections we've really got. We've got we want to start off with looking at specific issues relating to, to Build Housing Association itself and the issues around that. Then we want to talk about wider sectoral issues um, that have emerged uh, on the back of that. So, um, Alex, do you want to begin? <coughs> Good morning to the panel. Very grateful to you for your time this morning. Um, specifically to Brian from Beale, thank you for coming along today. Obviously, this is an issue which has garnered a lot of attention in the media, not least this morning. Uh, and indeed, it has in terms of casework to, I'm sure, all of my colleagues around the table in one way or another, either through <coughs> residents in uh, homes in our constituencies or through relatives who are concerned about those. I think the first question I would ask is why was so little notice given to families and residents about the intention to close, and in some cases that people were being accepted into placements in these homes just weeks before the decision was taken? Okay. Uh, we made our formal announcement on the, the 10th of October. Uh, the amount of time that we've given to um, residents, their families, and indeed to our partners in uh, health and, and social care to find alternative accommodation um, is, as in many cases, six to, to nine months. We started uh, having some discussions confidentially with health and social care partnership colleagues in uh, kind of mid to late summer. Um, and so contractually, we're only bound to give 90 days uh, notice of our intention to withdraw from, from a service. Uh, we feel that we've given more time to, um, uh, to residents and their families to uh, find alternative accommodation, uh, in some cases um, up, to, up to nine months. We're working very hard with um, other organisations to try and find alternative solutions, whether that's a transfer to uh, an alternative provider or to find uh, alternative accommodation. Um, the, the minute you make this uh, type of announcement, then uh, obviously business starts to fall away and staff will start to leave. So once we had made the decision, we wanted to move on it uh, pretty quickly. Uh, so 
th that, that's the sort of time scale that we're working to. We also have a financial imperative in there as well. We are losing significant amounts of money on our care home business and have done for a number of years and have subsidise that from uh, from our reserves. So we needed to take action and we needed to take action uh, quickly. Thank you for that. Um, I suppose the follow-up to that is what comfort can you offer those residents, for example, in my constituency in, uh, in Dunsmuir Court, um, which is a, an assisted living facility, not a care home, that there is no threat to additional the other kinds of facilities that you home, have in the social care environment? So the, the facility that you're talking about in Kirstorfen is a retirement housing complex. That's the bulk of our business. We have uh, over 4,500 properties that we manage of that nature. There is no impact on any of those uh, residents living in those retirement housing complexes. Those services will continue as they are uh, well into the future, foreseeable future. Okay, I suppose the, the final question is to, to widen it up. Um, is is there do we need to change the rules that we that govern care homes in the amount of notice they give need to give to their residents and the families who support them when a closure like this happens? And uh, how hostile is the landscape? How how many other um, organisations are in this kind of trouble? Or do we know? Perhaps health and social care. In Edinburgh? Um, so certainly I think there is an issue in terms of um, the availability. I can only speak for Edinburgh, but at the moment we're running at um, a pretty steady state of um, between 60 and 70 care home places short um, uh, in terms of the need. So I think there is an issue there around general availability. Uh, you know, what the analysis of the, of the reasons for that, I think, is, is, is probably complex and, and multifaceted. So I'm not sure that I would be able to come up with a, um, you know, a, a, just a single answer. Um, cost is inevitably, inevitably an issue, however. Um, and I think we do need to think about going forward what the what a, a reasonable and realistic rate would be in relation to um, care home places. But I really don't think that we can just look at that in isolation. I, I think that the um, the care home contract has, has served us well o over the years, but given that going forward, the, the model of service provision is needs to change and is likely to change and, and I think has to reflect the aspirations of people who perhaps don't want to be spending long periods uh, in, in the latter part of their life in, in what has been traditional residential care and what does that mean, what does the personalisation agenda mean for the shape of the market. Um, I, I think we need to look at it beyond just individual residential care issue and look at the whole of social care provision for older people and what that might look like and then within that what are the realistic expectations, both in terms of standards and in terms of affordability? And I think that is a question that, that goes beyond individual partnerships and, and their budget arrangements, but actually is a, is a wider discussion to, to, to be had across the piece around w what care we want to provide, what does it look like, and, and, and how much is it going to cost us and how much we can afford in terms of the, um, that, that public resource availability. And, and final one for me, just before I can see other hands coming up on that, but just as a corollary to that, the 60 or 70 um, people who are waiting for beds, um, what is typically happening to them right now? Are they sit sitting in hospital or just at home? Um, perhaps you don't have the figures for that, but is that how do you measure that? So the majority are um, in hospital. Um, because typically if people need a residential care placement, it is because their level of frailty and dependency is very high. Um, and I think, you know, the challenges in Edinburgh in terms of people delayed in hospital um, waiting for alternatives is... is, is um, well well documented so the majority will be there or they, uh, some might be in um, short term provision that is also very high dependency but is not a long term um, long term solution in terms of residential care um, so that's where we get our, our figures from Does the, um, the 70 become 90 to 100 when these two close um N not specifically in well in, in Edinburgh we're, we are hoping that the provision um, for the for the people currently within Edinburgh care home build care homes um, we're hoping for um, a transfer yeah, yeah. Uh, and we're still looking at that but but but, it, but the capacity is coming out of the system yes so therefore that's gone up 
you'll likely increase the number of people waiting. <coughs> you take 28 places out of the system. Or well, so in, in theory, in straight numbers, yes, although uh, as well as the 60 to 70 um, um, pe people waiting for a care home, there are vacancies across the city, um, but actually at, at costs that are well beyond the national care home rate. OK. Uh, Jenny. And good morning to uh, the panel. Um, in the Scottish Care Submission, uh, Dr McCaskill, you say the numbers employed in care homes have fallen slightly since 2008, uh, thus an overall staffing reduction is in itself an issue of concern. But on page seven of your submission, um, Brian Logan, uh, you say that you have essentially a higher staff place ratio. Um, so, for example, in Glenrothes, where I represent in Finhaven Court, you've got 24 service users with 25 staff. Um, but if you look at some of the other figures from across the country, Westport and Linlithgow, for example, with 14 places and 25 staff. And in the Fife Health and Social Care Partnership submission, it says that we continue to have capacity within care homes. We have no other sustainability issues. So, Brian Logan, I'd like to ask a direct question. Were staffing levels sustainable? The staffing levels that we have in place uh, were suitable to deliver the services and, and that's why consistently we were scoring um, high grades with the care inspectorate. Um, our staffing levels will vary dependent on the, uh, the size of the care homes, the physical layout of the care homes. Um, sometimes uh, the, the care homes were designed on the basis of a particular uh, staffing model. We will have made changes to some to make some efficiencies over time, but in others, because of the physical layout of the building, we simply weren't able to do that. So that's why there will be variations uh, in terms of those in terms of those ratios. We feel that the levels of staffing that we had in place were appropriate to deliver high quality of care to our residents. And you know, certainly the feedback that we've had even through this very difficult period has been the quality of care has been uh, first class in uh, our, our services. Yeah. Gordon? Yeah, I suppose wider context before um, focusing on the build issue, and, and that's to reflect the fact that there's been shifts in the market over the last five years. Uh, in 2013, there were, there were 905 care homes for older people in Scotland, providing over 38,000 beds. And in the five years since, that's reduced by 56 care homes coming out of the market. Um, now, that's reduced the numbers of beds by 883. One may have anticipated that with the dem demographic challenges that are being, being faced, uh, and notwithstanding the policy to try to support people to live at home for as long as possible, that, that we would have seen an increase in the number of beds. So that potentially says something about capacity and sustainability issues. Um, and in relation to the build um, uh, situation particularly, um, we have found it quite unusual to see a situation where a third sector <laughs> provider has decided to withdraw from the market, um, to withdraw 12 well-performing care services. Um, we've seen closures of care homes over the years. We've seen single care homes being closed as part of a corporate company. Um, but in terms of uh, this situation, uh, it's most unusual. We haven't, we haven't encountered that, as far as I'm aware, in, in, in recent years. What? Why do you think it is then that it's happened? I, I think it's a combination of factors, and I, I mean, Build have, have conveyed them in their submission. I think it's partly to do with the service model that they sought to deliver, which was better designed to meet need, the needs of people who were far less, um, who, who, who had a, fair, a, a, a greater degree of, of independence uh, than, than the current clientele. I think it's to do with um, the environmental model, where they have flatlets with, with large rooms, and it's more difficult to provide the support to those peoples, to those, to those residents. Um, I think it's something to do with rising costs not being matched by increases in fees. So I think it's a combination of all these factors, and, and, and be able to have outlined them very effectively in their submission. Donald? I just want to respond really to Mr Cole Hamilton's uh, comment about the hostile environment I think that's an unfortunate term, if I might remark, because the environment is fragile. Uh, there are a number of organisations, and the Scottish Care Submission has articulated this, who we know 
are at the point of making decisions about whether or not they need to withdraw from the market. And these are on the constituency which Gordon has highlighted from the a voluntary and charitable sector. And the basis for that decision making will be on the basis of financial viability. Can they continue to deliver dignified, rights-based, person-centred care on the allocated finance? And increasingly, organisations are, despite the degree of commitment from local authorities through the National Care Home contract, and increasingly coming to the point of deciding is this sufficient given increased dependency, increased demand, and the huge difficulties that we have, and we might want to come to talk about this later on, with recruitment and staffing. Is it possible to sustain yourself in the sector? Uh, it's not appropriate for me to comment about Beald, but I do know a number of other significant players who are profoundly concerned about their sustainability in the next calendar year. Jenny, do you want to come back? Thank you, Convener. Um, yeah, just as a supplementary, um, and really quite specifically to the constituency I represent, um, Fiona Mackay, in your submission, you talk about there being a buyer found already for uh, the, the care home affected in Glenrothes. Are you able to share with the committee who that is or any more details on that? And are you able to tell us a little bit more about the two care homes that are affected in Dunfermline? That, that might bring yourself in, Brian Logan, again. Uh, and lastly, um, you, you note that there's going to be the working group is going to reconvene in early December. Has that happened yet? the future of these um, particular homes, how a new buyer can make them viable when the previous one couldn't. <coughs> so for Glen Rossus, um, which is Finavon Court, yes, it has been bought by um, Kingdom Homes, and they have written out to uh, the relatives saying, now, it's not all concluded yet because these things take time, but um, the... the at the moment, the letter that we've had from um, Beald is that, that that home will transfer um, and we will support the relatives and families and the service users to make sure that that happens smoothly. Um, and we know the, the person that or the company that's bought that and they've got quite a lot of care homes in Fife, so we're confident that if they can see that through then it will be a good opportunity for them. Roundabout Finavon has quite a bit of land um, and we know that the provider in the past has, um, when they've bought other homes, they've developed them. So they will look at a refurb, I would think, because, as Brian said, the, the care home in, in Rothis has a very different model <coughs> to actually the, the care homes that that, that um, provider already um, has. So there probably will be uh, work done on that to actually probably bring up more beds in it, you know, than it, than it is at the moment. But it's a good it's good news that we've been able to do that. Um, Dunfermline is a very different situation because um, Beald have said they want to retain these um, buildings, but the people cannot stay. So we have to look at a different provision for them. Luckily, we have quite a lot of new build happening in uh, Fife, and we're building care villages ourselves. Um, we have a care village uh, due to open in April in Lumfinnans, which isn't that far away. Um, and we also have our own provision. We were de developing um, a new model of care in our own care homes, um, and we've put a halt to that. Um, so we are now sitting with between eight and ten beds in a unit, and we would hope to see if people can transfer um, and, uh, and mass from the care home in. And when we've done the reviews of all the people, um, lots of people want to go to that home. So it's really pleasing that we maybe have a, a good outcome from that. Um, we have a task group set up um, and actually meeting today again just to look at um, everybody who's been reviewed and what their choices are. So, uh, Brian, why could Bill not make it work in another organisation, Can? If I can just first of all comment on the situation in relation to Glenrothes and, and Dunfermline, and then, and then I'll come back to that. Um, in relation to Glenrothes, Fiona is absolutely right. Um, we are in advanced negotiations now with uh, Kingdom to transfer that property across to, to them. We've had some discussions with them. We've had uh, an offer in place, and we're now going through a due diligence process. So we're very hopeful that that uh, transaction will be concluded as, as soon as possible uh, to give certainty to the families and the uh, residents and indeed our staff uh, within, within that particular facility. In relation to the two care facilities, smaller care facilities in 
uh, Dunfermline. Um, we haven't had any expressions of interest in relation to those two properties. We've had numerous expressions of interest since we made our announcement um, across our um, suite of care properties, but no interest coming forward in relation to those two in Dunfermline. Obviously, if those came forward, we would have uh, we would have <coughs> looked at those, but uh, nothing has come forward to date. Though, Logan, um, Fiona Mackay just said there that you wanted to retain the buildings. Is that not the case then? Well, hold on, I'm just coming to that. So right. um, those two facilities are uh, adjacent to existing uh, other build services, so they are attached, they're integrated services and they're attached to existing <coughs> retirement housing um, facilities. So we would obviously do an options appraisal as we will do for any um, surplus assets that we end up happening. We will undertake some sort of uh, options appraisal as to what the best solution would be. But given that we have retirement housing, which operates very successfully in those two uh, developments, it would make sense for us to extend through and provide additional retirement housing facilities in uh, those, those care homes. Now, it would require a bit of investment to uh, achieve that, but we think that that can be that that can happen uh, relatively uh, straightforwardly. So, um, yes, th there is something that we can do with those assets. We can retain them within the the build uh, suite and um, uh, keep some services delivered for older people in in the Dunfermline area. Um, in relation to how others can make it work. I mean, clearly it's not for me really to comment on how other providers would um, make those facilities, indeed yeah, individual, wait a minute, wait a minute. individual facilities. You, you know up. the business, you know the market. I'm coming to it. How are they making it work and you can? I'm, I'm coming to it. So um, if, I were, if I were starting from, from scratch and coming in, um, these are two private operators that are um, taking over the facilities from us as a charitable organisation. Um, if it were me, over time, I would move those facilities to all self-funders, which provide um, a higher uh, income level. Um, I would um, potentially increase the level of the level of fees within those facilities to make them stack up. Um, I would look at pooling staff resources um, and I think in particular in relation to Kingdom, where they have um, a number of facilities in a very narrow geographic area, their ability to move staff between those facilities and not use agency staff, which are very expensive, is much greater than, than Beald has. We have 12 care homes scattered across seven health and social care partnership areas. So our ability to... Uh, deploy resources efficiently and effectively has been has been pretty has been pretty limited and again as as Fiona alluded to um, I would look to increase the number of units within those facilities we've done that in the past um, we've looked at a number of the care homes to try and increase the number of, of units and we, we've achieved that but that requires um, significant investment and given the level of losses that we have suffered we feel that uh, it's not an investment that Beald would be prepared to make. So just to be clear, it, your first thing you said was you would move out people who are funded by local authorities, no no, you, over time, over time and you would ensure that there's more self-funders to increase the income. That to me doesn't sound very charitable. I have if, to say, if I were a private sector operator, mm. then that's what I would do. Well, that's I, not that's not the business that we are in, and that's exactly why we have taken, or it's one of the reasons why we have taken to come out of the market. We are a charity. We have a social <coughs> purpose, and you know the whole reason for setting these care homes up in the first place was to provide good quality care for people most in in need, um, not people who uh, necessarily could could afford it. Okay. If we're moving to wholly self funding in order to make them stack up financially, then that's not the <coughs> business that we would want to be in. OK, we've got a number of people who want to come in. Sandra. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. I mean, I feel as though there's two strands to this particular conversation. There's a bigger strand about care homes and about, obviously, staffing as well. But if I could just ask Brian Logan, and, and I must say, I, I do declare an interest. My mother and father were in, in a built home, but a residential home. Can you, can you perhaps clarify for me you seem to say that residential homes will continue, but it seems to be the very sheltered and high dependency homes. And since you entered into that market, that seems to be where the problems have started. And I just want a wee bit of clarification on that aspect, because everyone's talking about residential care homes, but nobody's mentioned the very 
highly dependent sheltered homes, which obviously has been mentioned previously about people being in hospital. And I think it's important we clarify that, that point, that residential homes and in high dependency are entirely different. So basically what I'm asking is, when you went into the market, if you'll pardon that, that word, uh, of high dependency, uh, high sheltered, is that where the problems began? Okay, so for uh, clarity then, the, the are essentially three different types of um, service that we provide that are accommodation based. Um, we have what many of you will recognise as, as sheltered housing. We have um, rebranded those to retirement housing and we withdrew housing support services within um, those sheltered services some time ago. But we continue to provide uh, a, a, an element of um, support to the individuals, making sure that those individuals within uh, retirement housing live um, comfortably and, and securely. There is no change to uh, those properties as a result of this um, strategic change for Beald and for the 4,000 plus uh, residents in those services, as I said to Mr Cole Hamilton, um, no change there whatsoever. Um, the, the second tier are what we would describe traditionally as very sheltered housing, which is that higher level of support. And traditionally, where we'll have provided a bit more uh, of a, an on-site staff presence and we'll have provided a meals service. We're making some changes uh, to those services. Uh, at the moment, we are, again, because of pressures in housing support funding, we are um, withdrawing the housing support element, but we will continue to provide a meal service in those, in those facilities. Um, so we would hope that there wouldn't be a substantial change for service users in, in those properties. Our difficulties in terms of the financial position have come about in the residential care home sector, and that's the 12 care homes that we're talking about, which affect 167 uh, build uh, customers. So it's those that we are looking or we are seeking to with, withdraw from, because we feel that we, we don't have a place in, in that market. When we entered the care home market <coughs> 20 to 30 years ago, it was as a natural extension to um, our housing offering as a, as a housing association, as a provider for older people, and as already been uh, mentioned by, by Gordon, you know, we were providing a level of service to people with far less complex needs than those who are being admitted to care homes nowadays. It made sense for us to, to move into that market because it was still promoting independent living for older people. Um, that's why the flats were designed at you know, double the space standards of what the care inspectorate would look for now. They all have their own front doors, they all have their own letter boxes, they have their own kitchen facilities. Um, and you know, for that reason, there was an expectation that people that were being admitted to those uh, care homes at that time uh, would be able to live independent lives. That's not the case now in terms of people who are coming in. They have far more complex needs, um, often uh, <coughs> dementia. Um, and you know, in terms of us as a housing provider, we no longer feel that that's the market that, that we should be in. So as well as the financial loss that we're suffering on these particular care homes, there is a strategic decision. It's moved away substantially from the original intention 20 to 30 years ago. Thank yeah, you. Briefly, Sandra. Thank you. So even if, just for clarity, the people have contacted myself and others, I presume is that even if what's been asked for about the national care contract or extra monies, Beald would not be intending to continue with this type of uh, care home in the future. No matter what we would say or do or offer, so it would open it up to, to obviously other providers. Th that's for correct. Clarity. We feel it's not a market that, that we can operate in any further. We're keen, if it's possible, to keep those care facilities going. That's the best solution for the residents, for their families and for our staff. So we will do whatever we can to try and facilitate that. But it's not something that, that Build would want to so there's operate. no way that we in this committee or, or people out there, uh, users, would be able to save the care homes that you have under very sheltered or high dependency. You are withdrawing. We're not withdrawing from very sheltered. So again, for but absolute I'll, clarity... I, I need we're, clarity for the people that have contacted us. We, we're not withdrawing from um, providing those services. Those services uh, will continue. They'll be reformed, but those services will continue. We are withdrawing from the provision of registered 
care homes, the 12 registered care homes. So we're coming out of that market completely. Um, if that's you fine. were to that's, come up... That's absolutely okay. clear. That's Sorry, absolutely that's clear. Fine. Brian. I can give you a good morning to the panel. I, I wonder if I could broaden this out a little bit in, in the, speaking to some care homes who have uh, uh, gone into administration within uh, my, my own area. As I understand it, um, what's happened is that uh, the value of the business over the very recent uh, sort of history has, has kind of plummeted. So, if, so I know one, for example, who five, six years ago invested a, a, a serious amount of money in developing the care home and extending the care home against the value of that business. And then the business plummets in value. Uh, and then with the squeeze on, on, on the income, the then purchaser out of administration will not be saddled with the same amount of debt as the, the previous owner, if you follow me which then means that uh, for that period of time, it becomes more sustainable. But surely over a longer period of time, that isn't a sustainable model. And also, what does that speak to in terms of investing in this sector in the future, if that all made sense? Could, could I maybe add, add to that in terms of the finances of this? I wonder if you could clarify with us, did, did we make a profit last year? And do they have reserves okay and what and, and if they, if you do what are they okay um, first of all in relation to sustainability longer term particularly in the scenario you're talking about which is a, a, a I would guess a private <coughs> sector um, situation it's probably for others to comment on rather rather than rather than me um, our properties at the moment are are debt free and um, so in terms of the transfer, there's no mortgage sitting on those. We have some arrangements in place in relation to repayment of Housing Association grant, which would have been given to us to build the facilities in the first place, but that's <coughs> something that we are factoring into our financial calculations in terms of the, the, the running of the, of the business. In terms of the generality of, of your point, Mr Whittle, I, you know, I'm assuming that um, there's nothing in there that I would particularly uh, disagree with in terms of um, further investment in those properties and what that would then mean in terms of those being sustainable and <coughs> those being sustainable longer term. In relation to um, question, Mr. Finlay, uh, around uh, Beale's position, uh, I think we've said in the submission that, in particular, in relation to the uh, care home sector, we have lost uh, something in the region of 370. I'll come on to the, the overall position, but in relation to the care home sector, we've lost something in the region of £375,000 last year. Um, we've lost um, a similar level this year, and we've made losses in care homes for the last five years, which we have um, uh, withstood through uh, use of, of reserves. Uh, in relation to Beale's overall position, um, we have reported in our annual accounts uh, an annual surplus of £1.7 million. Um, I would say, and I can say this as, a, as, a, as an accountant, the bottom line figure in relation to the accounts is an artificial number. International accounting standards, and I'm not going to go into the intricacies of uh, accounting treatment, but it's rendered the bottom line surplus that we are reporting much less meaningful than it was previously. We've had to undertake a number of paper transactions around how we account for Housing Association grant, how we account for pensions, how we account for planned maintenance works, how we account for shared ownership sales. I think what's more telling, um, if you look at our accounts, and in particular our cash flow statement, you'll have seen last year uh, a net cash outflow from Beald of three million pounds. And obviously part of that is in relation to the, the losses that we've incurred around, um, around registered care. Again, if you do a comparison with the 25 other largest RSLs across across Scotland around operating surplus, still um, our operating. I ask you a very straightforward question: Did you make a profit last year? And what is your reserves? That's okay. all I'm asking. Well, the surplus position I've given you, which is 1.7 million, in relation to reserves, our reserves position is is over uh, 60 million pounds. But the bulk of that uh, is made up by our housing assets. So the only way to realise those reserves is to sell our housing assets, which so, means that we have no business left. So in terms of free cash reserves, we have an investment pot of five million pounds. So we have no debt, sixty million 
of reserves and 1.7 million profit. Is that I said we had no debt on our care homes. We, we are carrying some loans, but the uh, loans are, are of a relatively small uh, magnitude in comparison with other housing associations. Okay, thank you. Um, Alison. Um, thank you, Convener. <coughs> Um, I, I think that, you know this morning. I, I think this is a topic that we could discuss over the course of um, several weeks. But I'm particularly interested in the uh, Michelle Miller from Edinburgh. You, <coughs> I, I think your um, submission suggests that there's perhaps an increasing gap in the quality and security of care <coughs> available to those paying privately and those supported by public funding. That seems to be a theme in your um, submission. Um, Annie Gunner Logan, you're pointing out that providers like Beald are unwilling to run services at a deficit, and you really make a very strong point that you're re emphasising it's not the result of a general improvement in the funding situation for social care, it's the result of providers either declining to enter the market in certain circumstances or withdrawing entirely, which obviously has a big impact. And I think um, COSLA, Paul McClay, you're pointing out that. Local authorities can't afford to subsidise inefficient and or unsustainable business models. Now, we've been speaking about facts and figures, but we're also, you know, we're here to represent the people who are impacted by these decisions. And, you know, campaigners who've maybe heard on the radio this morning articulating the case of, of you know, the grandmothers, you know, much loved grandmothers who are going to lose their home. Um, the campaigners are citing the right to respect for home under you know, Article 8 of the United Nations, the UN principles for older people, um, the fact that relocation stress syndrome is recognised in North America. So while we're having these discussions, I mean, I think we need to have a national conversation about what we can actually fund and how we're funding this, because it seems to me at the moment it's, it's certainly insufficient. But what about the people at the heart of this? You know, do, do Beald, for example, recognise relocation stress syndrome? What is going to be in place for people who have perhaps sold their homes thinking that Beald was a long-term alternative? I mean, we certainly uh, acknowledge that, you know, this type of move can cause um, significant distress and, and anxiety, not only for the residents themselves, but also for the families, which is why it's been such a difficult and tough decision for Beald to take, why we've wrestled with it over uh, a number of years and why, why we've tried to put in place uh, many measures to, to avoid us being in, in this particular um, situation. So, yeah, we absolutely get the distress, you know, I, I, I get it day and daily now in terms of the uh, stories that are coming in to me and, and I hear those reports on, on the radio uh, as well and, and that causes me significant um, distress. It's not a situation that any, any of us would have uh, wanted to have been in but we feel we're at a position of, of last resort and obviously what we're now keen to do, our focus now is to make sure that the transition, whether that be to an alternative provider who will take over the care home lock, stock and barrel or whether it's uh, about transitioning individuals to move to uh, other care accommodation, our focus now is on making sure that that transition is as smooth as it as it possibly can be. And all credit to our staff on the ground, you know, they have tried their very best over the last number of months, successfully I think, to continue to deliver a high quality uh, care service and not to um, provide um, any anxiety or disruption to, to the residents. They're trying to keep it as, as calm as they possibly can. Can Alison, I, I'll, I'll mm -hmm. bring you back in. Um, Annie, sorry, did you want to come in? Thanks, I just wanted to pick up on a number of points that have been um, raised because I think they're really important this morning. <coughs> um, in the context of your question about how come one organisation can make something work uh, when another one can't, I mean, I, I think you could equally ask why can any number of third and independent sector organisations make the national care home contract rate work when public authorities can't? So they're directly provided care homes, um, which are generally kind of funded at a, at a much higher rate, and I think that's something that we might want to introduce into this discussion. Um, in non-residential care, uh, service contracts are transferred all the time because authorities retender them in pursuit of cost savings, and some providers come in at lower rates than others, and that's to do with often uh, 
I mean, at the, at the point at which we now have the living wage in care, the, the, the kind of wage competition isn't so great, and that is a great relief to everybody, but there are still issues around pension provision, organisational overheads, um, the amount of supervision that staff get. These are all bits that can be cut to make a service cheaper. Um, and as our submission advised, you know, more and more third sector providers are declining to enter these competitions for all the same reasons as Beald, and people are losing their trusted supporters. I mean, in this case, they're losing their home, but people, every day, people lose their trusted supporters because a, a service contract will, will, be, will be transferred from one organisation to another, and not all staff are tupid across. So um, that, I think it's really important to make that point. On the point of profit, um, just to be clear, uh, ch charities can make operating surpluses, they can make profits. They're non-profit distributing, so that means that any surplus that they return has to be reinvested in the organisation or the service. And most charities have a range of activities. Some return a surplus and some don't. So the extent to which you can actually cross-subsidise one area of activity to another is a matter for that charity and, and is a matter for the funding uh, route through which that charity uh, gets its money. So, for example, you know, if one council is, 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 is an, um, funding a charity to a kind of break-even or a surplus position, I think that council would have something to say about it if that charity then transferred that money to prop up something that another council wasn't, uh, wasn't funding to the same degree. So I think um, the, 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 the point here about charitable organisation is the extent to which we would expect a charity to be propping up a public service from either charitable income or from its own resources. And I think that's absolutely critical, because for me, these are public services. They need to be publicly funded. So, uh, did you want to come in, Michelle, or not? If I may, I mean, I think Annie makes some really good points. There's a, there was a, a point um, made by yourself in relation to, you know, the kind of tone of my submission saying um, national care home contract bad, private provider good in terms of, of, of standard. And, and I think there are in, inevitably, if um, a, a service costs between two and three times the national care home contract, there will be opportunities there for that quality to, to, to be improved. I do recognise um, Annie's point. I suppose for me, though, the issue is less about the kind of Im immediate debate about which model is the better and how can one organisation do something when another can't, um, is to say, in actual fact, I, I genuinely believe that the system overall is underfunded in terms of what it can deliver. And uh, within that, we can we can um, argue about different models and how can, they might be can, more efficient. Can just stop you there, because we're, we're coming on to wider issues in a moment, um, but I really want to keep us on the build issue just for the next few minutes because we're halfway through our session so if there's other issues specifically on build can people indicate now no so we want, want to move on to wide Alice do you have any <coughs> final points you want to make then well it's just you know I, I feel there's a bit of conflict here about prioritizing quality individualized care over economies of scale um, it, it feels in this discussion that it's not been needs driven, it's being finance driven. And I'm, I'm very concerned about that. And I would really like to hear more from perhaps COSLA and Michelle Miller about how our local authorities are, are working together, obviously, you know, with integration too. How is this working together? Because it's certainly a very challenging picture that we're being presented with today. Can I suggest that, that there are a number of questions certainly that I have and I think others may have in relation to be able to specifically but we will write to you um, afterwards um, with those if that's okay. Um, would anybody like to address the issue that Alison's just raised? Donald, you indicated yeah. you want it was It was actually one of Miss Johnson's earlier comments. She's quite rightly, as a number of us will have heard the very heartfelt stories on the radio and on the television this morning, because ultimately nobody works in the delivery of care if they don't have people at the heart of their concern and attention. But you are also right in saying that this is a human rights issue, and as somebody whose background is essentially within the human rights realm, this is Human Rights Week. Sunday was Human Rights Day. We are profoundly talking here about the lives of individuals, but we're also talking about the priority which we in Scotland give to the care and support of older people. So Michelle is absolutely right. Build is a symptom of a disease, and that disease is the current underfunding of social care in Scotland. And that's not just the case for the care home sector, which we're talking about today, but it is profoundly the case for care at home, housing support, and other areas.
And it is extremely important that whilst we are honing in quite rightly on the individual stories of pain, distress and emotional trauma which individuals experience when they're home, because that's what a care home placement is, it is somebody's home, is taken away from them through no control or fault of their own. It's quite right we concentrate on that, but we also need to concentrate on that bigger picture, which is how much, because in the end of the day it is a financial question, how much are we prepared in Scotland to pay for the support and care of some of our most vulnerable citizens, be they in a care home or in the community? I think most of us would, I think we would all agree that that is, actually, that is the, the nub of the debate. The reason we um, brought uh, Bill before is, for the committee is because if such a long-standing and credible and well-established provider like Build is in trouble in this, then is that an indicator of problems underneath in the whole of the system? And that's what we want to get to today. And Scottish Care submission, a written submission, yeah. highlighted just that. Yeah. Build has a long history of dedicated person-centred care. They're not members of Scottish Care, but I have known that reputation. And I know individuals like Ms White, who have been residents. I find it deeply concerning that if a charitable organisation like Beale <laughs> is unable to deliver and continue to deliver the care that they have thus far done so, then that does and it is raising a profound concern. And you are quite right, Chair, there are other organisations who are seriously thinking, can we at the present time, given what public authorities are able to, and I want to state, that to date the National Care Home contract has enabled a level of contribution and sustainability in Scotland, which has not been possible elsewhere. But that sustainability is now profoundly under question. Paul, I wonder if I could ask you to comment in terms of from Coslow's position. On which bit? Well, the whole bit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, certainly. There's been a lot said about the National Care Home contract, and I know people will have specific questions about the contract itself, about the rate, but also about the whole system. So I don't know whether you no, want I, to give me individual questions or I, just I suppose have basically speak. about the fundamental issue that we're discussing about the sustainability <coughs> of the system that all of the people here are operating in. I think COSLA's submission around the spending review on fairer funding for local government is really clear that we've got significant concerns in local government as to whether social care is sustainably funded in the round um, and we would look to Scottish Government through the spending review to give assurances and to support local government to support social care and to provide fair funding and invest in these services which are critical to all of our communities. So we do and in my submission we do highlight our uh, grave concerns about the future sustainability of social care in the round. Um, that is to do with keeping up with demand, it's to do with the complexity of care, it's to do with demographic change, it's to do with workforce pressures um, and, and a combination of those and our ability to respond to them as local government when our core budgets are being cut and additional burdens are underfunded, perhaps additional burdens are being put on local government at the same time. So having made that statement, I think I'd agree with everybody around the table um, about the, the need to prioritise and ask more fundamental questions about how much we're prepared as a society to pay for social care and where we can get that resourcing from. Local government is in the position of making very difficult budget choices at the moment. Um, we historically have been prioritising social care budgets. We have seen real terms increases over the last 10 years in social care budgets, despite seeing um, other aspects of local government's funding significantly cut. But there is a question as to how long we can continue to uh, offer that prioritisation and protection to social care funding, um, at the same time as acknowledging that despite um, having done that, we are not keeping pace with demand um, and are having to make difficult choices. In the scope of those difficult choices, in the round when looking at the system, we are having to say, in supporting businesses, in supporting third sector, 
uh, independent providers, how are we ensuring we've got a balance between covering and meeting the demands of our communities, mm -hmm. the number of people in the system, um, asking for and needing support against how we support individual businesses that perhaps over time have not kept pace in terms of their business model with uh, an efficiency model of, of, of doing business. So I know that Beald has highlighted the size of their businesses, the historic uh, configuration of the capital and so on as being issues with, with their, their own circumstance. And those are difficult choices. Within that, each local authority and each IJB are very concerned to protect individual outcomes, to look at what is best for the older people who are receiving care in these institutions and to make sure that they are supported, should something like BUILD happen, to um, manage their transition so that you don't have relocation stress and so on. But these are the symptoms of the overall underfunding in the system. In terms of the National Care Home contract, I want to have on record that local government in Scotland has um, prioritised and protected its relationship with the care home sector. We've seen over the last 10 years, year on year increases in the National Care Home contract rate. It's gone up over 42% over that period. Um, this is in stark comparison to the UK, where 81% of local authorities have reduced their care home rate, and over 50% of those have reduced it by over 10%. Um, so I think local authorities have got a strong record of valuing and uh, being invested in as partners the sustainability of the care home sector. But the environment that we're in is shifting, and we do need to understand as the sustainability and what it will take to be sustainable into the future. Some of that is about the business models that we have. Some of it's about the models of care that we're using. The need in the system is changing. It is becoming more complex. It is um, looking at more, more, I suppose, more complex needs within the system that have to be responded to. And integration is in that space of looking at how those people who are currently in hospital can be better supported um, by models, different models of care within care homes. We are looking at shifting the balance of care, um, but even within that, we've got further pressures on the system that aren't all about the rate. Um, it is about workforce in different parts of the country. It is about our ability to, in Edinburgh, find the people to actually provide social care provision. The both of those issues, workforce yep. and the, the, the provisions. But all of that contributes to sustainability in the round alongside the rate. The National Care Home Contract rate is and has been a, a good foundation for care home sustainability over the last 10 years. But we've recognised as local government that a single rate and a single contract is in itself perhaps not sustainable into the future. We have different markets in different parts of Scotland, both in terms of market competition, um, actual capacity within the market. Capacity is, in some areas, meets, meets the needs and in other areas doesn't. In some areas you need to invest, in other areas you don't. We need a more sophisticated model and that's what we're looking to reform the contract in order to respond okay. to. Okay. Um, Ash, do you want to come? Yes, I just pick <coughs> up on um, something from the COSA submission. You said that Scottish providers historically have been relatively stable and protected, and I think you touched on that in your answer. And obviously that mm -hmm. is partly due to the care home contract, as you've just spoken about. And we know that there's um, a programme at the moment to reform this, to develop it, um, and to develop a cost of care calculator. So I'm just wondering if you could um, sort of answer the question of how do you think the cost of care calculator will help the sector? And does there need to be additional reforms as part of that development? So the cost of care calculator is uh, at its core a way of both providers and commissioners having a shared, transparent understanding of what it takes to provide a care home place. However, it's very difficult, as you've seen, there are different business models that are different um, markets across Scotland. So even if we have a shared understanding of how you would break down a single cost of, of, 
care provision in a care home, even if we have a shared understanding of that, it may not reflect the specific business pressures of each care home uh, facility in each local authority. What we are looking at alongside that cost of care provision is how we enable the variation of that contract to respond to different models of care, be they enhanced nursing or enhanced residential, so that we can, A, um, give and provide for integration authorities the tools to commission more responsive models within their care home and the transparent funding basis upon which they can come to a, an agreement as to how those will be paid for. Um, so, you know, it is a mix. It's not just about a cost of care calculator. It's about a mechanism to vary that according to the models of care you'd like to commission to respond to the needs in your community. Okay. Um, Ivan. You know, um, th there was something <coughs> I wanted to, 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 to go into uh, uh, around about... Um, uh, types of model that are out there and integration. But first of all, if it's okay, I just wanted to pick up on uh, Dr. McCaskill's comments, which I'm, I'm interested to explore a, a wee bit further. Um, you said there's, there's an underfunding issue, which I understand. Um, clearly, we're in an environment where the provision of care becomes more expensive due to various issues year by year, and you'll have seen evidence of that over the last five, ten years. So I suppose what I'd, I'd quite like you to do is to quantify how big do you think the underfunding gap is in the current year and what do you think that looks like in the next five to ten years as the trends continue uh, with uh, the, the aging of population and the change in the profile of needs? That's a good question. I wish yep. I had had notice of that. I'm not, yep. unlike uh, Brian, I'm not an accountant, but uh, the Competition and Marketing Authority issued its report on the state of care homes in the United Kingdom uh, last week or a fortnight Talking ago. Talking specifically about Scotland here. Yeah, and they indicated a billion pounds was the shortfall in, across the UK. Now in Scotland, because of, as has been highlighted by a, uh, Paula from COSLA, we are not facing the same degree of percentage differential in terms of what a self-funder pays compared to somebody who is funded by the public purse. But if I can compare this current year's deal which was a 2.8% increase in the national care home rate. 1.8% of that went to statutory duties relating to salaries in the national and the Scottish living wage. So yes, there has been an increase of 18% in the last three years to care home providers, both charitable and uh, independent. 72% of that has gone to paying salaries for the workforce and we I know we'll go on to talk about that in in a minute we would estimate that if you take last year as an example the one percent which was cut which went to non-salary related costs <laughs> fell short by seven percent so we are working extremely closely with our colleagues in local government to draw up a transparent cost of care calculator. And I mean, what I mean by transparent is that if I go into a care home, I should know what my money is buying. If I buy that provision as a local authority or as an integrated board, I should know what I'm buying. And if I'm a provider, I should know whatever business model I have, what it is, is that is expected of me. So transparency is extremely important. And one of the insights doing that exercise is showing us is that whilst to date we have fundamentally had a sustainable model, we are profoundly concerned together with our colleagues in COSLA that that issue of sustainability is facing us very sharply in the face. And as I said earlier, it's not just about numbers, this is about people. I understand all of that, and I'm, but I'm going to press you on this. If I was Derek McKay and I was sat here and the budget's coming up this week and I had to ask you for a number, what number would you give me? If you're talking about the whole of social care... In Scotland. In yeah. Scotland, I would, would estimate that we're certainly talking about f north of a billion pounds needing to be invested across the realm of social care to enable our integrated joint boards uh, to properly fund the delivery of social care. Uh, the COSLA has, in their submission, highlighted that the promised set-aside monies to be transferred from the acute sector 
into community and primary care. That has not happened. That's £500 million. So we have not, in integrated joint boards and by implication providers and by further implication people who receive care, we've not seen that transfer from the acute sector in the NHS into the community. That highlights the gap that exists there, but in terms of sustainability, in terms of maintaining the services we have, never mind developing the rights-based system that the care and spectra in the new national care standards wants to see developed. We're some distance away. So I'm more than happy with colleagues to go away and do some thorough arithmetical right, exercise. Sorry, sorry, just stop there. It's your job, is it not, is to understand this stuff? Yep. Um, and I'm getting a lot of words, but I'm not getting much in the way of numbers. And numbers I'm getting are all over the place. You're talking about a billion extra needed across the UK, and you're talking about a billion for Scotland. Can you be quite specific, the billion or, extra or do you not have the number? Okay, the billion extra for the UK was the care home sector, right yeah, across the UK. Within the Scottish context, I would conservatively estimate in terms of the gaps of social care provision, the whole of social care from children to older people's services, we need a further billion pounds over the next three years. So you're talking about an extra billion pounds over the next three years? Yes. Um, so whatever it is, a third of that per year or approximately? Yes. And one of the reasons I say that is that, for instance, this, the government has committed £500 million to early years provision. That means the creation of 20,000 jobs in 18 months, in the next 18 months. We are faced with a critical shortfall in social care. Nine out of 10 providers are having difficulty recruiting. You can earn more for stacking shelves in a supermarket in Edinburgh than you can for caring. So we're going to be faced in the next 18 months with an even greater criticality. The only way we can hold on to carers and to the workforce, the only way we can build caring as a career of choice is if we have fiscal investment okay. so across the board. So you're talking about more than £300 million pounds this year just for social care? Yes. Right, okay. Um, and that's on top of everything else that's getting added into the health sector spending and what's happening in childcare and education, etc., etc. How would you fund that? I'm not a politician, and it is a inappropriate for me to comment as to what mechanism okay. is used. That, it, with due respect, is up to the okay. elected members right. around and the moving, table. And moving forward, you understand, because it's your business to understand, that the changes and requirements over the last five, ten years, if you project that forward, what sort of percentage increase do you think would be required to maintain pace with the changes in elderly age profile and, and requirements? Okay. We, we know the demographics are only going to go in one direction, mm -hmm. and that's great. Yep. We also know that people are living longer, and that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. But we do know that one of the consequences of that is that people are living with multiple conditions yeah, we, we know much that. later into life. So from that, that perspective, I would have to say that what we need to do is have a grown-up debate, a non-party political debate around how do we fund social care? Because no, to be so blunt, Mr McKee, you. to be blunt, nobody in Scotland has done the analysis of what the true cost of social care is because at the moment we don't have the arithmetic. And I can... I can do analysis from my perspective in terms of what care at home and housing support mm. and care home for older people is, but the totality of the picture of how Scotland is going to be able to afford to care for our most vulnerable, nobody's done that arithmetic. Sorry, is it not your job to understand that? You're the head of Scottish Care. I'm asking you, based on historical trends so far, what percentage increase you've seen in the past. You understand the demographics, you understand the age profile, you understand the cost pressures. Are you not able to put a number on that going forward? I have just put a number on it, and that is, in my estimation, that we need a billion pounds over the next three years you can't to grow the sector. can't a percentage increase year on year going forward beyond... Beyond three years. I wouldn't want to do that because I, that would be inappropriate. OK. Sorry, Ivan. No, just in case we want to open it up to any, anyone else. Yeah, the, 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 what I wanted to throw in, and it's kind of broadened that out a wee bit, um, there's a couple of things. Clearly, when you look at the, uh, the range of provision there, from hospital provision through uh, staying at home and everything in between, we talked about sheltered housing, very sheltered housing, the, um, the different care home provision, etc. Is there an issue there? Because, because what Bill, Bill were providing was one aspect of that, which kind of sat between the, the very sheltered and the, the more traditional care home provision. Is there an issue there in terms of the way the model is configured that, that 
hasn't supported that because clearly that's more expensive, or is there an issue around about that provision itself isn't needed in the model? And the second point, just to throw into that, which people may or may not want to pick up on, in a couple of the submissions, there was issues around about, and it's been mentioned uh, just now, the transfer of funding through the integration model. And there was talk about there's bed blocking going on, which is clearly very expensive, more expensive than care home provision or, or, or at home provision. But there seemed to be a suggestion that though, despite integration, there was issues about how that funding was getting, the mechanisms for transferring that funding, which clearly, when you look at the whole system, is problematic because the money's not going to the right places. Paula, indicated earlier, I want to come in, maybe want to cover these issues as well. Paula? Um, it was just a point of information that Audit Scotland, in their re recent audit um, of social work, uh, estimated that social care, if nothing changed in how we provide it, would um, need 16 to 21% more invested by 2020. Now, obviously, as part of that, look, we can't continue um, without looking at how we change our models of care, if, if only because we won't have the workforce to, to just continually grow what we do. Um, so, you know, that is assuming all things stay the same and we can't stay the same, but it does give an independent <coughs> analysis as to how much pressure that is in the system. I was just going to add that, that um, much as you know, an extra billion pounds over the next three years would be fantastic, my concern would be that if we use that money simply, and I use the word advisedly, to shore up or to fund the historical model that we that has grown and that we are that we are that we have now, I think that in three years' time we'll come back and say, can we have another billion, please, or another billion, or another billion after that? And there's something fundamental that I think we need to do, and the and the integration um, authorities have the absolute not just opportunity to do that, but the statutory responsibility to do it in terms of their strategic planning, their shaping of the market to say we need a different model of care, the one that is, is focused on individual choice, self-determination, control, prevention, a whole re wide range of different issues that will end up uh, creating not just a, a system of social care that individuals aspire to and want, but that one that is also sustainable. Um, so, you know, if, if, if you came along and said, here's a billion pounds, just fix the problem, I think that actually our answer should say no, we need to spend that billion pounds very differently. Um, and it's not just about changing the model in order for it to be affordable. It's about changing the model because it provides something that is better, that people want more of rather than what has gone before, without that implying any criticism of what's gone before, but it's a changed world. And what, what people tell us is that we want more control. The, the voluntary sector has been um, really a, um, the, the driver in terms of a lot of innovation, but we shouldn't be relying on individual small pockets of innovation and, and change. We should be thinking about that whole landscape and how we, we kind of garner all of the resources that are available to create that, that different picture in terms of social care going forward and, and use the input of people who use our services or people who care for the people who use our services to help shape that model rather than just, just promote something that has always been. Hey, Annie. Um, yes, thanks. Um, convener, I just wanted to kind of come, come back on uh, to sort of share, share some of uh, Mr McKee's frustration about um, the numbers around this. I mean, e each of our member organisations could tell you how much more they would need to keep their operation going and their services sustainable. You know, I, c I could add that all up and put it into the committee, but I just, I, I, I don't think that would get us very far. Uh, f for me, um, coming back to what Michelle's saying, um, I mean, integrated joint boards and their, st their duty to plan strategically um, for their future care needs, you know, that, that's kind of part of what this is about. Um, I, I think it's still early days for that, but if we're looking at the kind of a pan-Scotland picture here, then a number of organisations, including, including user-led organisations, have pressed Scottish Government for a number of years to look at you know, a commission for the funding of social care or, or some kind of exercise that would yeah. gather all the information that Donald could give, that I could give, that Michelle could give and everybody else, and actually look at that as a whole Kind of whole systems picture, uh, but it's never happened. Um, and I think you know this committee could help us uh, in that respect um, by pressing for that. Yeah. The Scottish Human Rights Commission, uh, in a, a lecture published on Human Rights Day on Sunday, made a very strong, passionate case for that 
funding commission around social care to be established in Scotland. Um, so, Alex, you want a brief point, yeah. and then Colin. Briefly, it's, I mean, quite visible that the politicians around the table to recoil at the idea of having to find £300 million every year for the next three years and then additional percentages on top of that. But it's, it's not just as straight black and white as that as well because there's a virtuous circle here because if you're thinking about 80 patients or 80... Um, people waiting in hospitals at perhaps four or five hundred pounds a night, then that frees up that capacity and indeed the flow within the health sector as a whole, uh, which has impacts right across the, the spending chain. Am I right? Absolutely. But that's on the one hand one of the real opportunities of integration the levers to shift those resources and currently although it is a early days the, the the weakness in that we haven't achieved that shift so i think that we absolutely need to focus on on driving that that change because that was part of what was um you know the basis for integration in the first place was to say you know we've got two big organizations essentially big bureaucracies trying to do similar things but actually there's an awful lot of duplication and there's an awful lot of kind of preservation and so on and actually we need to be the grit in the system that changes that and that allows those very significant shifts from acute to community to prevention and so on that will make a difference and and so we have the framework to, to for that to happen but it hasn't happened yet and i think that that's one of the really important unlockers in this in this issue okay colin i mean the two, two, two points that have been made is is about the need for change in fact lots of people made the point about the need for change so what exactly are the barriers to those particular changes. If you look at the, the, the National um, Care Home Contract, <coughs> all the submissions we've had, and most of the submissions we've had, have said it served its purpose, but frankly, it's no longer fit for its purpose. It needs to be reformed. And Paula mentioned the reforms uh, that are taking place at the moment around the, the, the calculator. But when will we actually see those reforms being implemented? When will we actually see the changes <coughs> taking place? Um, and what exactly are the barriers to those changes? So the, the National Care Home Contract reforms, um, we've been working on them for over 18 months. Um, that work is coming to a head, but it's not complete. Um, where we are, we've made a commitment to local authorities, IJBs and providers alike to circulate a progress uh, report by the end of December and to take a decision whether we're going to progress with a national arrangement, reformed national arrangement by the end of January, um, and thereafter you know, if, if, to complete the work that needs to be done as part of the reform. So there are some things that won't uh, be delivered within that timescale. We won't have all of the answers about how we will configure variations to the, to the contract by that time. Um, but we will have made a commitment that this is how we want to approach our relationship um, between commissioners and providers uh, over the foreseeable future. If that work does not uh, get endorsed by our respective partnerships, we would be looking at uh, local negotiations um, and those the, the contract and its national configuration would end. Why would... Why would <clears throat> IGBs or local authorities not endorse a model that actually would reflect the additional um, services that they would require? Is the, it purely financial? The, no, these are all choices to be made um, collectively. Uh, but when you Scotland isn't one market, so people have different conditions locally that when they look at the national arrangement we're working up, they will need to reflect on whether it is suitable for them and whether it gives them what they need. Now, hopefully, we have done our job in terms of uh, engaging with, consulting and surveying our members, and, and we will have uh, proposed for them a solution that everybody will endorse, but yeah, people will have to make, our, our constituencies will have to make their own choices in that respect. And, you know, as COSLA, we, we offer no guarantees on that. And just in terms of the, white, the, the, point, the, the wider point, what other barriers are there to the, the changes that we need? Because you're not going to get the best will in the world. There is a, a major need for a substantial increase in investment in social care. There's no question about it. You're probably not going to get a billion pounds over the next two years. Uh, and you've actually said if you got that in the current model, it still wouldn't be enough. So what are those changes and what are the barriers to those changes? Why are they not happening? One of, one of the biggest barriers is our inability to 
shift the balance of care at present um, from acute into community and social care. Um, and and our, our inability to utilise um, the budgets as per the Public uh, Bodies Act, that is a major barrier to the future sustainability of social care. Is that because of the lack of transition? Cash to make that happen? It's both transitional ca cash and our ability to shape and utilise the unscheduled care budget. Okay. Go on. Completely agreeing with, with that point. And, and just in case hairs were setting off, I wasn't asking for a billion pounds to be spent on the status quo to reform the system, which is what we're talking about. And we there is a considerable degree of unanimity between providers, commissioners, and people who use services that we need to do things differently. To reform that, that's what I was asking okay. for. But I think the real challenge, and it goes way beyond a finance, is that even if we, and I hope we will, and there's a lot of energy to get us across the line at the beginning of the year, even if we do that, will there be people out there who want to care? Because every day I get an email from somebody saying, I'm handing back work because I can't find the staff willing to care. I got an email this morning from somebody who said that she was at the point of having to make a decision. Her husband, living with dementia, his behaviour had deteriorated to such an extent that the local provision could no longer support him. There wasn't another care home in the local remote area that could do so, so that she was going to have to make a decision with her husband for him to be placed in a, a hospital setting, which will deliver fantastic care but at a distance from that person. The reason that is not able to be delivered locally isn't money, it's people. Fundamentally, we have a problem in that there are not sufficient people out there prepared to care. And it's maybe not surprising when, as a labourer, the national average is 11.50, but in care, the average is 8.45, going up to 8.75. So that's the bigger picture, which goes way beyond care homes into the fabric of care itself. OK. Uh, Colin, you finished? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Emma. Thank you, convener. Um, <coughs> Donald uh, touched on staffing, and that's what I'm interested in. In the Scottish, uh, in the submission from Scottish Care, you talked about how nurses are critical to ensuring safe and effective delivery. My first job was in a care home before I started my nurse training, um, and uh, I think that when we look at the statistics for nurses that are given up their registration um, or other statistics about how to recruit for this year compared to last year. I mean, obviously, we've got major challenges about um, recruitment. So my question is about are, are we seeing recruitment challenges across rural care homes as well as urban? And what would be the impact of this exit from the European Union as far as our care home staff that are um, providing care right now? The impact of Brexit is already happening. It's going to be quite profound. We estimate that the care home social care nursing constitutes about 8% of individuals who come from uh, the European uh, economic area and 6% of social care staff in general, particularly in older people's care and support. And that is inclusive of care at home and care homes. So we have really profound concerns. We have a 31% nursing vacancy level in social care. And we are actively seeking and working with the chief nursing officer to address some of those issues. But fundamental to all that is the report out this morning from the Royal College of Nursing, which is highlighting the degree of distress and emotional fatigue which the job of nursing is leading to. I would suggest that that is even greater within the care sector. We produced a report last month called Fragile Foundations about the mental health of our care staff. It was harrowing and it's disturbing. And we need to start caring for the carers. Otherwise, our present recruitment difficulties will appear to be small in comparison. Okay, I just, I, I, I sup for um, earlier issues about models of care as well. I mean, we've seen te technology supporting the delivery of care. There's uh, interreg funding across Ayrshire and Arden and Dufries and Galloway looking at Empower and uh, 
cosine, I think. So obviously we're, we need to be investing in the technology for delivery of care as well, which might support, but obviously that's not the, the whole answer. Yeah, it, absolutely. Technology has a role in enabling care, but technology can never replace presence. And so for many individuals at the end of life, for instance, and we've got to remember, most people now are in a care home for about 18 months. Many of them will die in that care home. It will be their last place, which they call home. They will be supported by very dedicated palliative and end of life staff. And in that role, technology has a place. It has a presence. <coughs> But ultimately, most people will want, at the end of their life, to have a human touch there. So providers are amongst the most innovative group of individuals, entrepreneurial, in order to make care more person-centred. We need to maximise technology to enable care, but it will never replace presence. Uh, Sandra? A very small one, because some of my questions have been answered chair uh, it's regarding staffing and obviously you've answered that particular one but would you agree the fact that people who get into care it's looked it's frowned upon it's not actually um, i hate to use the word sexy type but people don't seem to think it's a career that they want to go into and it's predominantly the women as well so one year you've got to have a decent wage for them but surely at this stage when you're talking about a commission looking at it we should be looking at actually uh, training up and, and making it a career for people to get into the care sector rather than something that people just happen to get in and out of. And my big, big worry is uh, regarding agency nursing. Uh, why are so many agency nurses being used rather than being able to use a nursing bank? Can I, can I ask you to hold a second, Donald? Because you've, you've, you've had quite a say. So uh, is there any else, anybody else who's want to um, respond to Sandra on those points? If not, I'll bring you in, Donald. I'm Danny. I mean, on, on, on that, um, I mean, I think if technology, there are hundreds, 200,000 people working in care now, and not all of them are miserable. You know, um, it's <laughs> a, a lot of people are doing a fantastic job and really enjoying it. Um, I think for me, and, and convener, forgive me, but it's never long before I start talking about commissioning. Um, but, you know, if, if, we, if we commission services uh, in which people get 15 minute visits, you know, in and out, you know, that is not a particularly attractive thing that people want to do. Um, if we worked much more with providers collaboratively to look at all the different models, I mean, we've talked about different models of care in future, how, the changes that we need to make. If we did that more collaboratively, then I think we could, we, could, uh, we could redesign care in such a way that people would be very, very attracted to it. Um, and I think there is quite a difference um, between, for example, services supporting adults with a learning disability than there is doing 15-minute visits for older people in a very kind of tiny, <coughs> tiny way. And I think that's where a lot of the very acute recruitment problems are because it's not the way we commission this it's not a particularly attractive job so i think that you know, we, we could kind of go much further up the chain here in in uh in sorting this out i just what i was trying to say is <coughs> we put a lot of emphasis and money into training up apprenticeships so surely a care career could be similar as well uh, to, to <coughs> the product and perhaps even leading to nursing as such as well. The other one perhaps is for a later time about okay. the agency nurses, if you no want. Um, Miles? Thank you. Obviously on the back of this committee, we've done a piece of work yeah. on making career uh, and caring a career yeah. choice. Um, and I don't think we've had a response from the government in a number of points, which we'd suggested. But I wanted to look at um, developing this further in terms of the future and some of the issues which we know are coming. And Donald... Um, McCaskill picked up on this point that the government has a focus of 11,000 people going into childcare, not adult care. How is that going to impact, um, does the panel feel, on the potential pool of people who might be looking to take up a career? And then secondly, the government are bringing forward a safe staffing bill, which will also cover the social care sector, including nursing provision. And I was interested to find out from the panel um, what your thoughts are at this point before that bill comes to Parliament. Very short time, we've only got about seven minutes left, so if you're responding, can you be quick? Anyone like to come in on those points that Miles has raised? Yeah, Paula? <coughs> so, <coughs> they, are, they are very good questions. I think the, the point that we would make in terms of workforce is that we can't look at adult social care in isolation. We have to look at 
the social care workforce across children and adults and we have to position them within the labour market, the local labour markets that exist. And actually, if you look at some of the burdens that are here and are coming in terms of workforce pressures around the early years entitlement, around free personal care extensions and so on, they do actually ask a significant question about where we're going to find these people from and in terms of older people's care there's a really significant question about how older people older people's care can be competitive against for example children's workforce and that tension is going to really affect our sustainability over the immediate and foreseeable um, future in terms of safe staffing um, I would say at, at present that uh, COSLA's position political position was to be um, very disappointed actually that the safe staffing legislation was extended to social care um, but I'm sure we'll be back to discuss that in some detail in the future. couple of responses to Ms Briggs on that on child care I mean it's it's um, it's speculation but I can tell you that there's some anxiety in our sector that those jobs will in fact be populated by people who are currently working in adult care um, and that's something to do with the with the kind of promotional activity that has gone on around about it uh, that, that is missing from social care um, we, we Donald and I and a number of other people have made exactly that point um, in relation to an initiative which is currently ongoing it's the national workforce plan for health and social care and we have made that point very, very strongly in that forum. Um, and just to back up um, on what Paula was saying about safer staffing, um, I have to say that the first that uh, CCPS and its constituency of third sector providers knew about this, uh, that it, this was going to be extended to social care, was about three weeks ago. Um, there was a consultation that was done much earlier in the year. The terms of that were framed entirely around nursing and midwifery, so we and our members did not prioritise that. Um, social care has kind of been brought into it very late in the day, and we uh, share Cosler's concerns about that. Uh, Michelle, did you want to come in earlier or no? no. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, I wonder if I could ask a few things just to, to finish off. In terms of um, this committee has got a real focus on health inequality, and uh, in Edinburgh's um, submission, they talk about, on the one hand, we see providers in affluent areas of the city who can, have, you know, they can charge top dollar um, and uh, to cover all the costs. They've got well-trained staff, providing excellent service. And then, on the other hand, we have a market where provision tends to be clustered in older buildings in less affluent areas of the city, with increased challenges in terms of um, uh, maintaining their grades, recruitment, and all of that. Um, are we now seeing a growing gulf in the inequality of care surroundings, facilities, and the whole package being provided to people on the basis of their income? I, th I think probably yes, but I think it's much wider. I think that the, the gap in terms of inequalities is growing generally across the board. And I think that the potential, the negative potential of that is, is, is really significant. Um, and, you know, there's an awful lot of talk and strategic intention around reducing those inequalities and the impact that that, that can have not just health inequalities but but inequalities across the board but what we don't seem to do is actually focus our resources on on doing yeah. something about that and Absolutely. all the research shows us that tackling that equality gap has a disproportionately positive impact on the whole population and all of the issues than just you know <laughs> leaving it or letting it grow and and i think it's it's about how we turn that research and what we know into strategic planning commissioning action and resource allocation to start to tackle that and that's i suppose what i was trying to get at in terms of some of that longer term visioning that we need to do around around what the system needs to look like and how we might then have more detailed discussions about how we fund it because we hear the, a lot of rhetoric from you know leaders in the sector and it could be government it could be civil servants or whatever about we're you know we're reducing the the health inequality gap but actually in this regard um the rhetoric is not matched up with reality on the ground is that correct i think that the um the, the rhetoric for me seems to be about the intention mm -hmm. but what we don't see is the action and the resourcing and then the evidence that that is making a difference because we are looking at an increase in that inequality rather than a reduction in it so there's something in there fundamentally which is absolutely want to applaud the intention but need to do something proactive about it that will make a difference rather than just talking about it 
Can I ask a kind of um, daft laddie question um, about the charges for care? So if if you have self-funders and um, local authority funded places in the same care home, um, why is one much higher than the other? Because Sorry? When, when people presumably are getting the same service? They're not necessarily getting the same service. A, uh, the Office of Fair Trading has made it quite clear that there has to be a differential to justify if, they are, if the provider is a, uh, charging an individual mo more than their business model. So the provider will ascertain and claim, as we have heard around the table today, what the true cost of care is. That's why we're doing the work on the true cost of care model, so that for everybody, whether self-funder or indeed publicly funded or local authority funded or private or charitable funded, there will be a transparency as to the true cost of that care. And that's what we hope to have completed by the end of January. So uh, do we have the situation, presumably went for a number, for a large number of people who are funded, say, by the local authority or publicly funded in some way, uh, living next to someone who is um, self-funded but they are paying exactly the same rate do does that <coughs> exist in large numbers in in terms of scotland scotland has a according to the most recent research we have about 33 percent of individuals who are self-funders in total the majority of care home provision in Scotland is individuals who are paid for by the public purse. Yeah, no, I'm, no, I'm asking a very specific thing here. So someone who's paid for by the public purse next door to someone who is self-funding getting the same service, are, are there significant numbers of people like that who are paying exactly the same rate? Are there significant... The, the, if you're a self-funder, you will be paying more than the public rate irrespective of whether you get the same service or not? You would be required under the both the contract, uh, under the law, to receive a better or a different service. And that's the, you know, we, we talk about inequalities <laughs> and we talk about health inequalities, but actually what we're talking here is about a care inequality. So I agree with you, convener. <coughs> it is unacceptable that because you are able to pay, that you get, in effect, a better quality care and support. Now, I'm being very careful. The quality of care that you receive meets the criteria of the care inspector, and Gordon wants to come in uh, in, in that regard. But additionalities, having a cinema, being able to go out and engage in activities, all those extra things which make the difference for individuals are not going to be possible to many individuals in a publicly funded care home, but they will be possible to individuals who live in a part of Scotland and they have resource in, to enable that to happen. I agree with you that that is inequities. That is part of what the National Care Home Contract discussions are looking at. How can we transform the system so that we create care equality? Sorry, Gordon, you wanted to come in on that point? Yes, um, just to say that whilst the care inspectorate doesn't have sight of uh, the extent to which people who are receiving care, uh, how they're funded and what contractual arrangements are, um, we concern ourselves with the quality of the care, regardless of, of, of that, uh, and don't have a locus. But using our grades as an indicator of, of shifts in quality in the care home market for older people in, in Scotland, um, we have seen improvements um, since 2013, when 7% of services were attracting our lowest two grades to the situation this year, uh, where only 2% are attracting those grades, uh, and 34% previously would have attracted our top two grades now it's 41%. So against this backdrop, um, we are seeing improvements. Now, that may well be because um, the poorly performing care homes are no longer operating, they've exited the market, or it may well be a consequence of our commitment as the regulator to support improvement, support sustainability, <coughs> and, and to seek to advance a number of means to do so. Um, but we don't have sight of whether or not the situation is different in relation to the experiences of people who are state-funded relative to those <coughs> who, who are um, self-funded. I would certainly be very interested to see what the differentials are of people in those 
properties uh, and, and, and what, what difference there is for that extra money. But what we're really saying here is that for people who are publicly funded, they are getting the base level service. And everyone else who is self-funded gets an additional enhanced service. That's, that's what we're saying, isn't it? No, I, I would object to that. <coughs> well, how would you describe it then? So, in the National Care Home contract, what we ask for is that people's, that the rate covers everything that is required to meet that individual's needs according to the quality standards that the care inspectorate applies. Um, and so we are not paying for substandard care, we are not paying for less care, we are paying for care that meets the individual's needs at the rate that it, that is there. I mean, I would say I'm not nego negotiating national care home contract that's going to pay for cinemas, but that aside... So um, can I ask then... There is a question... Can, can, I, ask so no, can I ask something? What are those people who are self-funding paying for? Th that's a question for providers, but because <sighs> self-funders get more for paying more doesn't mean that local authority paid for people are getting... Subs they're not. Yeah. We are not paying... Um, under the cost of care for substandard care, we are paying for high quality care to meet individuals' needs. But, but they're missing out on something. <coughs> if somebody's getting something that they're not, then surely they're missing out on something. Sorry, convener. As, as, as Paula has highlighted, the National Care Home contract delivers <laughs> high quality care, but other individuals because they have personal resource, are able to purchase additional services and provision. And so in the same sense that we all of us, if we have greater wealth, are able to exercise a degree of choice, then they are that somebody is missing out on something. Now, the critical issue here is how can we improve the already good level, which Gordon has articulated to such an extent that individuals are able to exercise a greater Good. degree of control so and just choice. Just ask a final point on this, but the option for them is not to purchase to not purchase those additional services. That's what you said. It's only to purchase additional services because they're self-financing. They can't go in at the same rate as someone who's publicly funded. That's what you told me earlier. No. If, if it is, would be unusual for somebody who was funding themselves to be charged the public funded rate because the organisation would normally uh, be delivering additional services. But those, so if you're in the National Care Home contract and you need additional services, then there is provision for those to be funded. But each individual's needs is a, are assessed on their own particular outcomes. And bearing in mind that the majority of people in nursing care are going in with particularly high level clinical needs, it is those that, particularly the National Care Home contract at the moment, is enabled to focus on to deliver high quality care. In residential care, where somebody might be moving in on their own volition and choice, for maybe four, five, six years, then that is the sector where there is a greater differential in terms of rates. Um, I think we could be here all day on some of this stuff. Um, I, I, what I'm going to do, um, we're really we're way over time already and we've got a very important session to come next. Um, I'm going to spin around the table and give people 20 seconds to have their final say, final ask. Could I also ask each to comment on Annie's suggestion about there being a, a major commission um, by government on this, led by government. Um, I know that different political parties, I know my, uh, I led a commission in my own party, and I think other parties have done that, um, and it's a very informative process. Uh, so if people could comment on that as well, whether they think that would be a good approach. Um, but just a final whiz round the table, and just you've got 20 seconds, no more. Um, Paula, do you want to begin? Thank you. <coughs> um, so I think uh, Cosler's position, um, both on care homes and on social care in the round, is that we do need to have a look at whether there is sufficient resource um, in local government generally, um, but also in local government for social care to meet the future <coughs> needs and demands. How we do that 
is is another question whether that's a commission or something else but we need to have more reassurance that both the core budgets that are there and the additional budgets agreed generally through um, financial memorandums which support legislation <laughs> that they are adequate adequate at the time they agreed and on an ongoing basis thereafter where we see okay, um, you're increases well over. in cost. You're well over. <laughs> okay, thanks. Fiona. Um, I just really um, I welcome the discussion. I think we really do need to look at a major commission and going forward. I think what we struggled a bit with is we've started to deliver new models of care and we need the GPs to be part of that. Um, and with integration, I think we are starting to have these better conversations. But um, when, you're, when people are coming into a service or a model for maybe just four or five weeks and then moving on, that's a big ask for a GP to keep picking up um, especially if they're not in their vicinity. So, but I welcome um, looking at that major commission. Okay, Donald. Scottish Care would support calls a statement that we need to seriously look at the overall funding of social care. In addition, we would argue that whilst applauding initiatives and individual policy initiatives, we need to join those up. And as one of the early signatories for the call for there to be an independent commission looking at the funding of social care, which includes what the role of the citizen is in that funding, we would certainly support that. It's different from looking at the system and how we reform that, because we're all involved in that, but nobody's really looking at how are we going to pay for it. Yeah, I think I would add to that that um, we've been trying to advocate a, an asset-based approach in relation to the individuals who use care services, to not define them <coughs> a, according to what they lack, but to see them as citizens who have ambitions, hopes. Um, I think we need to think of the social care system in the same way. I think we need to see it as a positive rather than a drain an investment rather than a cost. I think we need to see it as the career of choice, where people are rewarded, remunerated, and have security and fulfilment. Uh, and do you support the Annie's suggestion? I think, we, yes, I think we would support the idea that we look more forensically at some of these challenges and opportunities. Brian? Just to reiterate, uh, Convener, that you know this has been an intensely difficult decision for Beale, but if there's any good that's come out of it, it has raised this issue up the political agenda, it's opened up the debate, and hopefully the outcome might be an ongoing, sustainable solution for the future of, of social care. And yes, I would very much support the, the suggestion of the Commission. Annie? Um, three things in 20 seconds. Um, sustainability is a real concern. It's not just care homes, it's right across care and support. Our submission said 33% of providers have withdrawn from service uh, in the last year and another 10 on top of that are thinking about doing it before the year ends. So this is big, the first thing. Second thing, um, the commissioning for the Commission for Funding. Um, I've brought it to the committee's attention, but I can't claim credit for making the call. There were a number of us who did that through an initiative called uh, Our Shared Ambition for yes. Social Care Support. Yes. And critically, that initiative was led by Independent Living in Scotland and Inclusion Scotland, user-led organisations. And I think, you know, so this is, this is a kind of commercial pitch here. This is from people who actually use services who are looking for this primarily. Last thing, um, the third sector provision in care homes and much uh, of other adult care and support, and I think Gordon will bear me out on this, generally speaking, achieves a higher quality than either the public or the private sectors. Um, and, that, and our main focus is on publicly funded places, convener. Uh, and so I think that is why we should all be very concerned about what's happened at Beald, and they are not alone in this. Yeah, Michelle. Michelle. So certainly would uh, support the, the proposal in terms of a, a commission. I would hope that where it will take us is away from what I think sometimes feels slightly sterile debate that say, that's very diametrically opposed that says local authority bad, voluntary sector good, NHS good, public se uh, private sector bad, except the, and those kinds of very strong positions. And I actually say that fundamentally what we all want to do is try and achieve a model of care and quality of care for people who, who, ne who need services services um, that is something that we can all um, um, absolutely contribute to and subscribe to so I, so I certainly want to have have that debate and then the last plea would be around absolutely let's make sure that that the outcome of that hopefully is that we fund those public services um, more effectively but not to fund the status quo and to fund something that is both more visionary and more anchored in what people who use the services are telling us that they want okay Sheila 
Yeah, I'd just like to echo some of the comments that have been made um, around about looking at new models of care. That's something that certainly our members that provide um, care and housing support would want to do. But we also, I think, the majority of our members provide general needs housing. But that's where an awful lot of people that... <coughs> If we're looking at preventative services and adaptations to homes that need to be adequately funded, that's something that we'd very much welcome a, a, a bigger debate on and a national conversation. And I think also I, I echo Cosler's point as well around the um, locality planning. And housing providers are very keen <coughs> to engage with IJBs on, on how we can make that work. OK, thank you very much. It's been a very um, interesting and informative session this morning. I'll suspend briefly to change the panel. Thank you.
Uh, agenda item two is NHS governance, uh, uh, and we're looking today at NHS clinical governance. Can I welcome to the committee uh, Fraser Morton and Ella Brown. Um, at the start of the committee's work on NHS clinical governance, we heard uh, from both Fraser and Ella at our informal evidence session with NHS patients about their experience of the NHS. And I'd like to thank both uh, for coming that morning, uh, and this morning indeed. Um, I think your willingness to share information on such a, a very difficult and, and emotive personal experience uh, is greatly appreciated by all of us on the committee. Um, just to provide a, a very brief introduction uh, to both of your experiences uh, before we begin. Um, uh, first of all, uh, Fraser Morton, Mr Morton's uh, baby son Lucas was stillborn at Crosshouse Hospital in Kilmarnock in November 2015. Uh, Mr Morton and his wife June were one of a number of families calling for a public inquiry into infant deaths at the maternity unit. The Cabinet Secretary subsequently instructed an investigation by Healthcare Improvement Scotland into the management of adverse events in the maternity unit uh, and uh, the report from that investigation was published in 2016 and made a number of recommendations for both NHS Ayrshire and Arm <coughs> and for the whole of the NHS in Scotland. Uh, Ms. Ella Brown, uh, Ms. Brown lost her father uh, following a fall in Victoria Hospital in Fife. Since then, she worked with NHS, uh, the NHS board to bring about changes aimed at reducing hospital falls. And this has included the falls uh, call to action events, which brought together staff, patients and carer expertise to uh, aim to reduce harmful falls by a fifth. They did this through improving practice, patient uh, care pathways and the hospital environment in general. Um, over recent weeks, we've taken evidence from a range of stakeholders in NHS cl clinical governance, and we're keen to, uh, that both Fraser and Ella were provided with a further opportunity to speak to the committee to comment on those themes and the issues relating to NHS clinical governance which have been raised at these sessions. Um, so we're going to move uh, to questions, um, hopefully until probably maybe about 22 We'll try and wrap up then. But first of all, welcome. You're very welcome to the committee and thank you very much for coming. Um, who would like to begin our questions? Alison. Um, thank you both very much for, for being with us this morning and for um, all the evidence that you've provided. Um, it has been very helpful indeed. Um, I, I think my first question specifically um, I'll, I'll address it to Mr. Morton. In evidence recently, Professor Leach, I, I know that you are following the evidence very carefully, um, Professor Leach confirmed that there's no central monitoring of serious adverse events, and he suggested that the definitions of an adverse event are so broad and varied that centralised reporting might not actually be helpful. He believes that we have to rely on the boards to have processes, including clinical quality committees, and regular morbidity and mortality meetings so that individual clinicians can discuss cases. Um, uh, how do you feel about Professor Leach's comments? Uh, I, I don't understand them, to be honest, because my, uh, my understanding is there's actually a national framework for adverse events that came out in 2012 or 2013, and it's been recently up, uh, updated. So I believe there should be some sort of standardisation of what is an adverse event. Mm -hmm. Uh, after the 2012 HIS review uh, and the NHS Air Sonaran, I believe that <coughs> the Healthcare Improvement Scotland describes adverse events as the springboard into which they drive improvement to make sure they don't happen again. So if that's the case, I believe there should be some sort of standardisation uh, to identify adverse events. That would then help us identify any recurring themes or trends within Scotland. <coughs> uh, in terms of, you know, the collation of the statistics, that isn't happening. We were told at a, a meeting we were at with the HIS review team that everybody's basically doing their own thing, despite there being a national framework in place. Uh, I think there has to be some sort of, you know, methodology or you know, uh, standardisation put in place to collate these statistics so that we can then 
you know, address them uh, and actually target our finite resources. Because basically what we're talking about here in adverse events is you know, things that went wrong, badly wrong, uh, and fatalities. You know, it's not just a <coughs> statistic. I wonder if you'd like to comment. I was always aware that adverse events, um, from what I knew from Fife Health Board, was just one one thing. There wasn't all these different things going on, but I have no problems with uh, what they do. I see all the false reports every month of every ward and every hospital in Fife, and things are improving. There's blips, there's up and down, but I think you can have too much charts and different things. It's all about people, nurses, doctors, everybody speaking to each other, working together. Not all the paperwork, and I think the nurses are complaining about too much paperwork half the time of filling in forms, and we need to get back to hands-on things. And I have no complaints about NHS 5, but I have heard different things. I've picked up things at the last time I was here that not all the health boards are working the same. There's great gaps in what's good and what's bad, and I don't think you'll ever get everybody in Scotland working to the same hymn sheet. It won't ever happen. Um, with regards to, um, I'd like to understand to what extent witnesses believe that inadequate staff levels or staff training are a factor when things go wrong in the NHS. Um, I'm very aware of, you know, the, the campaigning that Mr Morton and other families have done um, will ensure that multidisciplinary CTG training becomes mandatory, for example. Just wonder if you could comment on that. Definitely staff training was, and staff, staffing levels was not good when my father fell and fractured his skull because I campaigned after I started to work with the NHS and we got six more nurses on that ward funded by the government and there's still a lot more funding goes into things like that. But it is to do with staff levels. Mm -hmm. I mean, the staffing levels, uh, Mr Morton seemed to have increased markedly um, as a result of the, the work and the campaigns uh, yourself and other families. Can you comment on that? The staffing levels... Uh, in the evening, our son died. We were told initially that the staffing levels were short by 30% in the maternity unit. Uh, if we go back to, to missed opportunities, if you correctly monitor, collate, and to use the buzzwords, drill down into adverse events, it should be possible to identify recurring themes. And one of the recurring themes is inadequate staffing. And just to actually give you a kind of overview on that, uh, nationally, the Each Baby Counts campaign identified that one in four, you know, stillbirth or neonatal deaths can be uh, contributed or, or, you know, uh, to lack of resources, and that's nationally. So there is a problem with staff levels and resources. Uh, in terms of missed opportunities, over and above the, the adverse events that are produced, the Embrace UK produce, you know, stillbirth and neonatal death statistics, and I believe in 2013, NHS Ayrshire Naren were one of the worst in the UK, if not the worst in the mainland UK, uh, second only to Belfast for obvious reasons. Uh, they were red flagged for that, for these statistics, and that basically commits them to doing a, an internal review, an internal investigation, and I've read that internal investigation, and it was very outward looking, you know, it was like a scattergun approach, they looked at multiple deprivation, they looked at drug taking, they looked at obesity, they looked at smoking, you know, they looked at everything apart from themselves. It wasn't inward, it wasn't a retro, uh, an introspective. And I believe that's an opportunity missed. That was conducted in 2015 because of the lag, <coughs> collating statistics, etc. And only two years later, as a result of the recent his review, we now have, I believe it's 16 additional midwives, mm -hmm. two sonographers, mm -hmm. Uh, one additional consultant and a labour suite risk management midwife or something to that effect uh, within place. And for that huge amount of staff, I, I believe that could have and should have been identified earlier. You know, if the adverse events were collated and monitored properly and if a proper investigation was done into the red flag figures from 2013 from Embrace, I believe these shortcomings should have and could have been identified earlier. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Um, Ash? Good morning. Um, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about how you feel levels of accountability for boards are. So we've heard during the last few weeks um, that whether it be um, a, some kind of serious event or whether it's just um, a different type of complaint, that boards are both investigating these things themselves and they're also responding to these themselves without much kind of, um, I suppose we'd say, higher level um, involvement in those. <laughs> so do you think that boards are sufficiently held to account for what they're delivering? 
<laughs> the quick answer to that is no, to be honest. The NHS Air Sonarin's definition of clinical governance is it's a statutory obligation and is a framework through which NHS Air Sonarin is accountable for continuously improving the quality of its services and safeguarding mm -hmm. high standards of care by creating an environment in which excellence in clinical care can flourish. Despite my best efforts, I've still not been able to establish, you know, if it is a statutory obligation, which piece of statutory legis legislation covers that obligation. In terms of accountability, if they're indeed accountable, I don't know who they're actually accountable to. I can only speak to our own circumstances in NHS Air Sonarin, but if you look back, you know, I, the terms clinical governance and adverse events were obviously alien to me and my family until November 2015. But I quickly became aware of the intervention by the first of three cabinet secretaries in 2012, the first of three his reports in 2012. If you go back further still, in 2009, NHS Ersonarin actually admitted to having difficulties in actually applying the management adverse event policy from 2009. I can take you back further still, and I've looked at action plans going back to 2006. These action plans are produced on the back of adverse events. And these action plans, I was actually shocked to see the same themes and trends, the same failings in care in 2006 in terms of staffing, training, handover, communication. In 2006, these were the same areas that failed Lucas in 2015. So during this period, we've had the intervention of three cabinet secretaries. I believe Alex Neal actually stated in 2012 that he actually challenged the non-executive directors in Ayrshire and the wider NHS Scotland to, to apply a greater degree, degree of scrutiny to the executive management team. Uh, we also had uh, an investigation by the then Strathclyde Police in Ayrshire and it fought suspicious, suspicious deaths. Uh, on top of that, the Scottish Government, according to Jason Leach, actually collate or look at the adverse event statistics by looking at the, the board papers. And again, I think someone made the point, it's difficult to do that if there's five, six hundred pages. You know, how you can lift that information out. If that's indeed the case, I don't know how they missed the fact that Air Sonarin were averaging 19 adverse events per year, which Robbie Pearson stated in his report in 2012 was low. He says that was low. The following year it was zero. And this is happening during a period where there's supposedly a national framework, there's supposedly greater scrutiny by the Scottish Government. You would like to think there'd be greater scrutiny by the actual board, the health board. You'd like to think there'd be greater scrutiny by HIS, who actually implemented or helped to implement this, this policy. But this went, you know, that this this went missed. This was this was missed for a period of three years. Ella, do you like to come in? Well, my experience is I've worked a lot with patient relations and that's how I've got to know the health board and all the things that are going on and I see all the reports and I work with the patient relations a lot and I think they're doing fine. I mean, it's five years ago since my father died, but we've moved on all the time, gone and spoken at conferences, done all sorts of things, got out into the public domain, spoken to people, get them to speak to each other. My thing is a hands-on thing. I don't know figures or facts. I just work off my own thing. I was so angry when it happened. I felt I had to do something and that's why I started and I just did it and I still feel driven to do it I just that's my way of approaching things but I believe it's speaking to people and keeping it in the public domain and I do feel what my experience with Fife is they're working very hard in patient relations who do the major amount of work between all the different departments and it is nothing's perfect but it is a lot better than it was five years ago and it's still improving. Mr Morton, can I just follow up that by asking you after your last answer, so do you think that the boards should potentially have less discretion then over how they, they manage these and that there should be some other way of managing it? Do you see that as being maybe more central control over the boards? How would you how would you visualise it going forward? Uh, I'm not really sure. I'm not, I'm not a healthcare professional, but I think the board obviously missed an opportunity. The senior management missed an opportunity, but I believe the way it worked in NHS Air Sonarin is you've got the clinical the, the kind of silo system of the clinical directorates, mm. and then it's progressed to the risk management committee, which I believe the CEO is on that and actually chairs. Then it's then put forward, the, the adverse events that is, is then put forward to the healthcare governance committee, which I believe non-executive uh, directors of the board sit on. 
And I believe the final decision, uh, whether it's a Rasfair's event or not, is then taken by either the clinical, sorry, the medical director or the nursing director. So the system is in place, and I believe it, it has been improved in Ayrshire and definitely has been improved. But if I, if I go back to 2012, you know, it, it was definitely missed by the executive management team. It was missed by the board. It was missed by the, the wider NHS Scotland, or if you can call that the Scottish Government. It was missed by Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Nobody was actually collating. If these events are the actual springboard to which we drive safety and improvement, well, you can't improve what you don't measure. No, they weren't even being collated. And if you look at the disparity in the figures throughout the 14 of Scotland's health boards, it's clear that there's no kind of standardisation. Mm -hmm. And it's clear the national framework has not been implemented. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yep. Um, Brian? Bring to the committee's uh, attention that uh, Mr. Morton's a constituent of mine, and uh, I've been working in his case specifically. Uh, uh, good morning uh, uh, to Mr. Morton, uh, Ms. Brown. Um, I wanted to ask about the HIS investigation, and, uh, and, and do you reckon that was instructed in response to? Um, immediate attention or, or was the Scottish Government already aware and, and managing the issue? Can we start with that? As far as I'm aware, you know, I wrote to, I, I found the, the feelings that deep, that, that widespread within NHS Air, Air Sundaring, that I believe you could say that we as a family circumvented the complaints policy. I wrote, I, I wrote to the clinical, uh, sorry, the medical director, I wrote to the CEO, uh, the response wasn't what I hoped. I then wrote to the Cabinet Secretary. I got a response from, I believe, <coughs> someone within the office. Uh, I wrote again, you know, and then reluctantly, after a year, a year of trying, I wrote to everybody. Uh, during this period, I, I was also dealing with the Scottish Fatalities Investigation Unit. Uh, and then we reluctantly, you know, sought media attention. And as far as I'm concerned, the intervention was only actually initiated after the adverse media publicity. In, term, well, in terms of the, uh, if we're going to the actual HIS review itself, um, I, th I think the question I'd really like to ask is, is, is HIS fit for purpose in this particular uh, uh, arena? Uh, the neat answer, no. Uh, if I can expand on that a wee bit, this, we've had three HIS investigations in Ayrshire Naren. 2012, the follow-up in 2013, which missed the fact that Ayrshire Naren had already decided to circumvent the recently embedded management of adverse events policy. And the decision to do that basically negated any chance of learning from the failings, you know, and putting measures in place to prevent them happening in the future. Uh, I thought what was actually interesting was that you know, his himself, they also stated that they expected, this is in 2017, they expected material progress to have been made since the previous failings were initially identified in 2012. Now, you might not be aware of that comment because that was in the draft report, which I received through an FOI. That never made the final report. I don't know why. You know, you can judge by yourself why that never made the final report. But HIS seemed to be like the... I don't know, the, I've described it before as mission creep, the, the ACME, the NHS Scotland, they've got a, a wide remit, and I think they're just taking one too much. No, I'm okay with that. Um, could I ask about, in both the cases, um, so there would be guidance and standards that medical staff are supposed to be guided by, <coughs> which presumably were not adhered to, and then you then come in and you raise, compl raise a complaint, was that at, a ward le at, at the ward level at first, or did, would, did you go to a higher level initially, did you go straight through the complaints process? Was the complaints process ad adhered to? So, so was there a failure in guidance? Was there a failure in the complaints process? And ultimately, how did you get to bring about that change? 
So that one first. I didn't go through all the, the committees and different things that you have done. I just went. My, fa my father moved was in that ward for a hip, repl uh, hip replacement when the Victoria Hospital changed over from the old to the new, and there was lots of problems with that. Um, when he was in that ward, I could see that it wasn't it was totally understaffed, and I told him that my father would wander, and they said, oh, yes, yes, and different things, keep my all shot. And I told the nurses, watch him, he'll wander, and no, the short story is they didn't watch him, and the next night he got up, went to the toilet, fell, fractured his skull, so he died. So I was very angry at the time. They were very good with me at the time, with different people helping me and that. And then I went away home for about a month, and I thought, this is no good, it's getting to me, it's going to destroy me if I don't do something about it. And the social worker, who was my dad's social worker, said, right, to, there's a new uh, organisation just started patient relations, um, just right. I mean, I was hurt and never contacted me during that month. I never came to the funeral, never did anything at all. I was just abandoned. So I wrote a... Six, eight page letter, I poured the whole lot out, sent it off to patient relations on, say, the Monday night, the Tuesday morning at nine o'clock, I got a phone call from patient relations, absolutely horrified at what happened, and that started working through them, and it was all done and through them. And patient relations, are they part of NHS they're 5? They're part of NHS yeah. 5, but yeah. they're not totally organised, they are um, independent, they look at it from both points, they take your points to the, the higher-ups that you're complaining about, and that's where it all started. But the they're not a totally independent uh -huh. organisation, but they do uh, care for the patients and yeah. what's happened. They are sort of a buffer zone between the, the public and the So initially, the when, board. when the incident happened and you, uh, presumably horrified at what happened, you, did you raise that with ward management at that well, point? Well, I spoke, yes, yeah. uh, and the doctors came and spoke to the nurses. The and, and that was largely just dismissed? No, it wasn't, no, it wasn't no. dismissed, but they dealt with it. But what they, but I still didn't think, I saw there was a lot of problems here that had to be addressed, and I wanted to address them. Yeah. They did what they could, they were very sympathetic. It took 10 days for my dad to die, and they were very good during that time. But I just knew there was a big gap, yeah. and there was lots of problems, and I just felt so angry I wanted to address them. OK. Fraser? Uh, in terms of the route, uh, the complaints process, uh, I was within hours of Lucas time that I was really, really uneasy about what occurred. And I actually done a bit of research and I, you know, I came across the 2012 review where NHS Ayrshire Aaron, according to the papers, were accused of suppressing adverse events. I downloaded the policy, the management adverse event policy, and I familiarised myself with it. Uh, the care we got, I must say, from the individual staff, following the staff was, was second to none. It was, it was great. You know, I, I can't fault that. We were assured that it'd be taken very seriously. There'd be an investigation, a serious investigation. What kind of spurred it for me, the, the, the final straw for me, <coughs> is that we were given a death certificate stating unknown. And due to previous family deaths, I was aware that certain deaths have to be notified to the Crown Office, the Scottish Fatalities Investigation Units that now is. I quickly gave them a call and they had no record of Lucas's death uh, and that resulted in myself and my partner June actually being interviewed by two police officers. I actually split up. Within weeks of Lucas's death, split up in their home and I have no complaints about Police Scotland by the way, it's just process. Uh, but it was, it was awkward to go through that, to give her statements and Lucas's death should have been notified to Crown Office, and I can pick up on that later. But again, then I lost all faith in the complaints process. That's what initiated my complaints to a higher level. That's why I circumvented the complaints process based on what I'd learned about the history in NHS Ayrshire Marin, based on what I perceived to be shortcomings and then notification of her son's death. Uh, that's when I took it to the board and further afield into political domain. So, Ivan, you want to come in? Yeah. Hi, thanks, and, and thanks very much for both of you t uh, coming along this morning, because I know it's, um, I, I, I think it's very commendable that you're, 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 you're pursuing um, your respective uh, issues, hopefully to, 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 to generate benefits across the whole, uh, the whole health service. I think I just wanted to kind of compare and contrast, and, I, and I'm sure there's shades of grey in here, but looking at it from the outside, it kind of looks like there's been two tragic events. In one case, um, uh, we've seen with regards to Fife that they've, they've kind of, after a while, have embraced 
your perspective on it. They're involved during the process, and they're, um, from what I've seen, making significant progress in, in terms of the way processes and procedures are changing to the benefit of everybody. Whereas in, uh, in Mr. Morris' case, it seems to be the opposite. If I'm not mistaken, he seems to have been kind of kept at a distance, and it's more of a, a kind of confrontational um, outcome. Is, is that fair comment? And, and, it, and do we think that that really comes down to the different um, leadership um, in each of those respective health boards as to how this thing's been uh, been viewed from their side? I think so, because I, it was, the staff were all very shocked and horrified at what happened at Fife, and they were very kind to me in different ways. I had the police investigation and all the rest of it. But they didn't uh, put up any barriers. I was welcomed in from the minute, and I said I wanted to work with them once we'd, we got different... I got uh, letters and different things and phone calls from people, but they said I could come and work on their committees and different things. Would I come and do this? They changed all the boards, did lots of things, took me around to let me see everything, and... I'm still working in different ways and different committees with them, NHS 5, five years on. And they're not, at least... And that was the time when NHS 5 was battered daily in the papers about everything, and I just thought, this has to stop. Somebody's got to do something about it. And that was why I was trying to get the staff and the public, everybody, to work together and talk to each other and not put up barriers and be frightened of each other. And that has worked. Is that in your experience? I, it's fair comment up until fairly recently. <laughs> it's recently as yesterday. Uh, I met with John Burns from Ayrshire and Aaron, and I like to think that they're turning a the corner. But in terms of very recently, that, that, that would be fair. That was our experience. We, we were held, definitely held at arm's length from the process. Uh, we received a root cause analysis report that basically 12 words summed up the, uh, the summation as uh, we could not find a root cause for this event. That's what looks as if it's an event. You know, and that would have been le that's where that would have been left at. His death would have been unknown in terms of the National Register of Scotland and the hospital did not find a root cause for that event. And it's only through our efforts that's taken a toll, it really has to a toll myself, our family, that we've got to where we are. In the last few days that there's been a change in attitude or a... a only yesterday, communication. Only yesterday, I met with John Burns and a member yeah. of the board. I wonder why. Yeah, I, I, may I suggest that it is no coincidence the fact that you're appearing here today and Mr. Burns was here last week. I'm, um, I'm not going to speculate, but yeah, uh, let's, let's not speculate. But it's good news anyway that I, things appear to be moving on. What and, and what came from that conversation, if you don't mind us asking? Uh, Mr. Burns, he gave me an overview the implementations, the changes that we're doing. And I believe they're actually putting things in over and above the recommendations from the, the his review and the the commitments from the Cabinet Secretary and the Chief Medical Officer to make multidisciplinary CTG training mandatory. Uh, if you look into the national figures, the medical legal costs relating to CTG are enormous. They're, they're, they're huge. Uh, it seems a false economy scrimping in us, and I believe that now, and this hasn't always been the case, uh, the basically CTG training is all but abandoned in NHS Air Sonaran due to insufficient staffing numbers, and I got that confirmed again through a lengthy FOI process, and I had to appeal to the Commissioner to actually get that information. It was abandoned for 13 months. Uh, it was a, That started in December 2015. <coughs> For 13 months, the month after Lucas died, we were told everything, you know, this would never happen again. Uh, but again, significant changes have been put in place, and I believe they're actually trying to embed in is mandatory what's called the prompt training, which is nationally, internationally recognised in terms of improving outcomes and reducing fatalities. Anyone else want to come in? Miles? Can I first start by welcoming both to the committee? And I think, um, you know, over the course of the work we've been doing, the work which you've <coughs> both done has really been shown to make a huge difference, but specifically in those hospitals where these incidents occurred. And it was really the culture of our health service, which we keep returning to, of covering up some of these incidents or, or not really engaging with it because it's seen as a failure. And I just was interested to know your personal views about the culture, having you know seen it and and actually seen it change in both these cases. My um, experience was that the NHS Fife at the time it happened was absolutely terrified of the Sioux Society. We'd admit to nothing, see nothing, not talk to anybody, not raise their head above the parapet in case somebody sued. 
And I said to him right at the beginning, I had no interest in suing anybody. I just, money wouldn't bring my father back. I wanted to improve things. And that made a difference. And it's, they've got braver and braver as the years have gone on. And it's a totally new atmosphere in NHS Fife. And even when you go through the, I can only speak about going back and forth to the Victoria Hospital. And you go through the front door, it's totally different. And it's, I've, I've done training videos with them. I've worked on the duty of candor these videos. They've asked me to go and speak at conferences and just get people to work together and do training and how the patients feel from the patient's perspective. So I have no complaints about them at all. We're all learning all the time. Mm -hmm. and can I ask in terms of that, how have management within the health service specifically changed, do you see? You know, it's very much frontline staff you've referred to. But frontline staff and all the senior uh, directors of nursing I work with and the higher people as well have all changed. They're all much more open. I've, I've, I've not found any problems. The, some of the... Um, that, uh, Tricia Marwick's now in charge when it used to be Alan Burns and different things, but I don't see any difference. It's mm -hmm. still the same, uh, working the same way, going forward all the time. Yep. Good. Uh, yes. Uh, in terms of what you're saying about the, you know, the, the, the legal culture, uh, our experience was somewhat different. We were actually challenged to sue. I believe that's the best way I can describe it. We were actually challenged to sue. Why don't you just sue us? And I believe that was in response to questions we're asking, you know, difficult questions surrounding the, the, the failings into her son's death. Yeah, uh, sorry, um, I've got Jenny first and then you. So a little supplementary. Um, Ms Brown, just to, to Mills Briggs' line of questioning, why do you think the culture's changed? Because you alluded to uh, NHS board chairs changing, that not having an impact. What do you think has been the impetus behind that shift in culture? And secondly, do you think what happened uh, to your dad could happen again? Are you quite confident now that there are structures in place or that there are changes that have been made that would make you feel confident that that couldn't happen again? I don't think it can happen again. Well, the different things they've put in place and what I see with being on the falls board, from coloured wristbands to falls protocols to all sorts of things. We meet every two months to see that happening. And I don't feel there's been, what I say about the things not changing, I don't feel there's been a backward step with yeah. top management changing. Things have been ignored or shoved in a drawer and forgotten about it still ongoing and all the committees I'm involved in are still ongoing and are still from geriatric clinicians to everybody's on these committees and they all speak and the doctors are all coming on board with the nurses mm -hmm. and it's all working really amazingly well. Yep. Not saying it's perfect, nothing's perfect, mm -hmm. but it is improving. Thank I'm you. Quite, quite confident. Mm -hmm. All of the, the practical things that happened, the real things that happened, you know, we hear a lot of people saying, oh, we all work together. And when we ask them what does working together mean, sometimes they can't tell us what that means. But what kind of practical things happened in the wards, on the ground, to that, that fills you with confidence or increases your confidence that it couldn't happen again? Well, my father had he was early Alzheimer's, but he also had a fractured hip, so he was put into an orthopaedic ward, and a lot of the orthopaedic nurses weren't used to dealing with elderly people with dementia and different things. So they started to bring dementia nurses and things on to get water in hands, like call bells, all sorts of things, all, all that change that's still ongoing yet. Yeah. And they evolved, evolved that way in different areas working together. And was there changes within systems yes. that had to be rolled out across the... All the five hospitals in Fife work from the same system. So did that require a whole, um, I don't know, module of training for them? Yes, there was uh -huh. people brought in to do training and different from the psychiatric hospital that's just to other... Different uh, St Andrews Hospital as well was on different to Victoria, but they were all given training, training managers, training plans set out. I saw that for myself. They were all sent to me to be, to be scrutinised. Excellent, that's good. You, you've told us more about how some of these things roll out than some senior managers and uh, senior well, I'm executives. I'm just a people person. I don't do reading <laughs> brochures. I just talk to people and watch and pick up could, things. And could maybe do we use a chief executive of an NHS well, board? I'm, I'm available. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, Emma, Emma. Thank you. Hi. Sorry, were you? Yeah. Ah. It's just a quick question, um, and thank you for coming today. Um, you've described that culture has changed in both places, even if it's a recent change in Ayrshire and Arran. Um, so nationally, like for me, my background is clinical education and nursing, and I know there's learning modules about falls and falls prevention in both the community 
and uh, in acute care. So it might be that the development or the rollout of training, whether it's learning or face-to-face, -face, delirium assessment is something that does occur in orthopaedic units now. But I'm interested in how you would see the national picture uh, like evolve. How would you want to see the best culture portrayed nationally across all boards? Uh, culture is really improving. I don't think anybody's actually arguing against the point that uh, a culture of continuous learning improvement is a way forward to mm -hmm. improve patient safety and quality care in Scotland. But I don't see any reason why that can't happen within a regulatory framework, which is currently missing. I believe that, you know, uh, regulations set, you know, they set goals, they set objectives, and they come into force when they objectives and goals are not achieved, which I believe is the case, our case. Uh, our behaviour is governed by regulations, but, you know, currently, I don't believe the, the regulatory structure is there, you know, when the, the cultural improvement in learning falls short, is achievements and goals, and I've liked something like that in place. How that's put in place, I don't know, but nobody's asking for a CQC-style organisation to be uplifted and embedded within NHS Scotland, what's now? I think we need to recognise, we've got, first, certain people in certain organisations need to recognise we've got a Scottish problem, and we need to find a Scottish solution to that. Are you confident that the lessons learned in each of the health boards you're describing around the terrible, terrible circumstances <coughs> you encountered, are you confident that that's been passed on to every health board, every one of the 14 health boards in the country? Or, as this committee is repeatedly encountering, are you, is it still victim to the very siloed culture of the 14 health boards where what works for one isn't often replicated in another? Are you aware of how much that best practice has been passed on? I don't think so. From what I've seen coming to this committee and speaking to the MSPs before, and what I heard, um, and what I've heard of other people trying to complain about things at Nine Mills Hospital and can't get anywhere. I mean, I can really only speak from my experience uh, of Fife, but I don't think it's passing on because I've tried to say, oh, call patient relations, they'll help you, but the, some of the places they don't even have, they don't seem to have patient relations. So it's not um, passing on, I don't think. A, lo a long way still to go. And Fraser? I go to obviously your scenario. I don't see how an organisation that admits to having problems, issues with the management of adverse events was then allowed in 2012 to formulate and try and embed in their own policy when they've previously admitted to, to having serious issues with it. And I believe that's the responsibility of Healthcare Improvement Scotland to actually, you know, create a culture of learning across the entire NHS Scotland. And I don't think that happened then. If were specific to adverse events, which I've looked into in great detail. They're not collated in a standard way by each of Scotland's 14 health boards. They're not routinely monitored by Healthcare Improvement Scotland. I don't believe the Greater NHS Scotland or the Scottish Government, I'm not sure how you kind of uh, diversify between the two, looks into that by monitoring the board papers. I don't think that's possible. That's a really untidy and a, a kind of awkward way into actually getting, which should be a simple collation of figures to draw down into and look for greater learning. But, so you've got a kind of tripartite failings there. Uh, if I go wider, if you look at some of these deaths in terms of Lucas, the Crown Office do not even collate the number of deaths and any themes, patterns or trends for the deaths that are then notified each of Scotland's health boards to the SFIU or the Greater Crown Office. The other deaths, again, we're back to his again, they've got the death certificate review service. So out of 57,000 deaths, for example, in 2015, over 47% of the death certificates were found not to be in order, which is roughly 27,000 deaths. Out of that 27,000 deaths, I think it'd be fair comment to actually suggest that some of them possibly met the criteria for notification to the Crown Office and the guidelines issued by the Crown <coughs> Office. And again, I've got an FOI pending to see if that's the case, to see if any of these 27,000 deaths have been retrospectively submitted to the Crown Office for greater scrutiny. And if you look back into the, I'm not going into great detail, but if you look back into the findings of the shipment inquiry, 
that's something we need to have in place. That's an important safety net in your society that I believe has been missing. Thank you. You're saying that 27,000, when, how long was that over, what period? 2015, 47.1% .1 of deaths. This is, the deaths that are, this is medical certificates that are sent to National Regs of Scotland and I believe it's an organisation. I don't know what happened before then, if anything, but from 2015 an organisation called the Death Certificate Review Service, which is under the umbrella of his, yeah. Starts to, they, they sampled 5% yeah. and out of that 5% they found that 47.1 in 2015 were not in order. And is that work being continued? Yes, in 2016 seen it fell slightly to just below 40%. Uh, I don't know what processes and improvements were put in place to, to actually drive that improvement, but it fell down to 39 point something percent in 2016. And within that, have they identified what the issues are? Well, that's it. I mean, if adverse events are indeed the springboard from which we drive improvement, and again, if you look at patterns... No, I'm talking about, the, you're saying an accurate death certificate, yeah. Aye. So therefore, have they identified what those inaccuracies are? No, no not in the document I looked at, no. Okay, that's helpful, thanks. Um, Sandra, you okay? Yeah, my question's Ryan. been answered, thank you. I've uh, noted that uh, at the start that I have a <coughs> relative working in NHS Ireland, mm -hmm. so apologies for not saying something like that. I, I kind of wanted to go back because I think what's interesting here is we've got two completely different um, experiences here. And I, I think for me the the, um, the key here is the implementation of recommendations. Once we get once, once we get to that point, and and uh, from 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 reviews and from from uh, your own experiences, and I wondered. Um, again, if we could highlight the, 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 the differences in the way that these investigations have been implemented. I'm also very aware of uh, Mr Morton's case, but uh, you seem to have a much, had a much, much better experience. And I think, for me, that's the, the key to this. Yes, I did. And that's why I wanted to bring that to when I came to the last time as well. Um, was to prove that I had got a much better experience. I was not abandoned. Well, I was for the first month, but after that, um, I was much more accepted and done what I wanted to do and still am. I've been taking on to do interviews for patient relations jobs and just anything like that. We need to come along and do that. And I'd just like to do things like that and just get from the public perspective. And I feel they're much less frightened of suing and everything else now. They've come out from behind the barrier and uh, got in touch with the public. And so your experience is the implementation of those recommendations that come out of that are very positive? All of it's been very positive. Okay. And Mr Morton, you would perhaps say something slightly different? Uh, immediately, when the, the terms of reference to the recent review were announced, <coughs> I believe they were too narrow. I believe the time frame was too short. The time frame we, was based on improvements made by NHS Ayrshire and Arran, and then we find that one of the findings of the review team is that you know, they would expect material improvement. So, again, in the terms of reference only looked at the maternity service. And the adverse event policy covers every directorate. So right now at this moment we, we actually don't know the full extent of the avoidable deaths within NHS at Ayrshire and Arran because we, it's a common policy and they've concentrated in one small area. So who set the criteria then? I believe that was the Scottish Government in conjunction with Healthcare Improvement Scotland and if you look at the time frame as well it conveniently missed encompassing the 2012 review. It's if, almost as if Healthcare Improvement Scotland didn't want to actually look at their own part in this process. That's how it seemed to me. And I wrote to the Cabinet Secretary and I wrote to Robbie Pearson, you know, and if you go back, there's a lot of talk now, if I kind of digress a wee bit, there's a lot of talk now in Parliament about uh, health and social justice, or sorry, health and justice, you know, a collaboration. I asked for terms of reference to be expanded. I asked for a memorandum of understanding to include uh, the Health and Safety Executive, to include the Crown Office uh, and also include an expert in human factors because one of the things we were told, uh, specific to our own son's death, is that we can't see what happens in inside people's heads when we question why my partner June was not escalated as per the guidelines. So I think it was a reasonable request for an expert in human factors 
the health and safety executive who actually found that the greed there was systemic failures and failings in clinical governance, and that put them, the HSE, in a diametrically opposed view to the actual health board. And it's just been left at that. You know, they agree clinical failings. The hospital initially did not admit to any clinical failings, but we just moved forward without anything being addressed. And in terms of the memorandum of understanding, that was reasonable. That was a feature in the Morecambe Bay inquiry. So I don't know how it could, could have been expanded within the recent review within Scotland. OK, we've, we've come to the end of our time. Um, can I say, we greatly appreciate you coming forward. I think you've done your families very proud, not just by giving um, evidence today, which is obviously a difficult thing, but by the fact that you are pursuing the issues that you care so passionately about and hopefully um, will change the system for the better uh, so that other people do not have, exp have to experience what you have experienced. So thank you very much for your, uh, your evidence this afternoon and uh, uh, we'll now, um, I think we're now going to private session.